rise and join me in salute to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call, please. City Clerk, roll call, please. Please note all council members are present. Thank you. Adoption of the agenda. So I understand we're going to move item D, new business, which is the presentation, to the August 1st meeting. Okay, with that change, uh, did your motion include that, Seppi? Yes, sir. Thank okay. you. Okay, all second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Oral communications number one, an opportunity for people to address the council on matters not on the agenda. Do we have anyone? No, I don't see anyone, okay. Consent council. Mr. Mayor, is it okay? Um, I, I'd like to make a motion, but uh, can you read the items, please, on the, on the consent calendar? Sure, I'd love to. Approve city council minutes of June 6, 2011. Approve City Council minutes of June 13, 2011. Approve the City of Brisbane's response to the County of San Mateo Grand Jury Report on the use of cell towers. Consider approval of City of Brisbane's response to the County of San Mateo Grand Jury Report regarding the use of tasers. Okay, a motion to approve consent calendar. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Public hearing. Item A is here. Any protests on proposed water sewer rate increase and give direction to staff on proposed on the proposed increase. Do we have a staff report? We do have a staff report. Good. We have a long staff report. I, I have a suggestion to um, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Um, after we kind of go through this, maybe take the public testimony, but I'd like to hold the public hearing open until uh, August 1st to make a decision on this in, in light of our heavy agenda so that uh, um, we move this portion to August 1st after staff presentation. Anybody wishes to speak on this, then move it to August 1st, keep the public hearing open, and then at that point... Uh, Continue the public hearing until and, August and 1st. And if staff, is that okay with the time frame of that? I, I guess it, I should ask. Yes, it is. It is. Okay. Clay? Yes, it, that, that, that works. That works? Yeah, we're, we're not planning okay. on implementation. Okay. Also good. Okay. Okay. Please proceed. Okay. Honorable Mayor, Council, we're, we're back. Um, tonight we're doing the, the protest meeting for the water and sewer rate increase. A little bit of background is that we... To raise rates, we have to do a Prop 218 mailing and notification of property owners and customers. We did that in May. We came back, the 45 days were July 5th. We are doing this presentation to explain a lot of the things that council and the subcommittee have asked us to, to explain on what's in, what's in the rates and what are the different definitions of depreciation and, and enterprise funds and a number of other things. A good deal of what we're looking at is the fact that if we don't have the rate increase, we have, as the charts up here show, the, we have our expenditures are quite a lot higher than our revenue. And with the budget increase, we would come a whole lot closer to being equal. To begin, we're going to begin with a little bit of history. In 2000, which is about the time I started with the city, we had engaged FCS Group to do a review of the rate structure and the infrastructure. They did. They began their public review process in 2000. They continued it through 2001. Council had five meetings for public hearings, and then in 2001, they reviewed and adopted the ordinance that also included a provision that we would pass through any rate hikes from our our providers and the cost of living. In the meantime, 
the courts decided that water and sewer rates were really a property were related to pro were related to property and required a proposition to 18 um, notification also in 2001 when we were doing this FCS group rate recommendation was a two to three hundred percent increase to cover ongoing maintenance and capital um, in 2002 the council reviewed continued reviewing the rate ordinance and we had some rate increases and then we held meetings concerning criteria for master plans and to award the contracts for the master for the water and sewer master plan uh, 2003 the council reviewed the water and sewer master plans and set dates for workshops in 2004 and in 2004 we had held the workshops and reviewed the master plans this is important because the master plan was part of our capital improvement projects which of course affects our rates jumping ahead to 2000 to, to 0910 we projected a cost of living increase in water and sewer rates but given that the prior year had had a 17 percent increase council decided to leave the rates alone in 1011 staff re recommended a three percent increase which the subcommittee sent to the council but be again because of the economic climate the full council declined to raise rates so to look at it since 2001 2002 we have raised water rates total of 186 percent we have raised sewer 173 percent and our proposed water increase is, is almost a 25 percent increase in water and a four percent increase in sewer and let me explain why but first we're going to explain what an enterprise fund is an enterprise Prize fund is a fund that provides goods for services to the public for a fee that makes the entity self-supporting which makes it quite a bit like a business the difference between us and a business is that a business can have a profit we may not what's behind the cost well we have San Francisco Public Utilities Commission we have infrastructure we have depreciation we have indirect costs and we have the community demands and expectations and I'll explain those right after we start our water journey. SF Puck has water, it pipes the water from Hetch Hetchy, which is up here in the Yosemite National Forest. It comes down all the way through Sonol, across the bay, and up the peninsula. I always thought that was a long journey. So it gets to Brisbane. Once it gets to Brisbane, we have three city zones and three GVMID zones. And this is just their way of, of managing the water and the flow of, of, of the water. And this cute little slide is the altitude that the water has to go. Down here we have sea level and then we have to pump the water up way far for Guadalupe tank, we have Margaret tank, we have Crocker. So we need the infrastructure to get the water from down at ground level all the way up the hills. And that is why we have all of this for, for water infrastructure. We have pipes, we have check valves, we have pressure reducing valves, water mains, water tanks, pump stations, and meters. And that cost us, not what it's worth, but what it cost us way back when, $15,500,000. SF Puck rates, just to show you how this has affected us and why, why it's been a little bit iffy, is in January of this year, they told us to expect a 31% increase. In April, they told us to expect a 47.4% increase, and in May, they finally got the authority to raise rates by 38.4%, effective July 1, 2011. Every water agency served by SFPUC has, had, has the same increase, and I was fascinated to find out that just about every city on the peninsula, and in fact, two-thirds of, of the Bay Area, is, gets their water provided by SFPUC from Hetch Hetchy. The cost of Hetch Hetchy, of re retrofitting the Hetch Hetchy pipeline is about a four and a half billion dollar project that is supposed to be completed by 2015. That they will, of course, be passing on some of those costs, a lot of those costs to us. And ironically, conservation has led to the increase also because when the revenue falls, you have to raise the rates to cover your fixed costs. Now the other half of our water journey is the sewer where we have we don't have to have pumps things because everything just kind of falls back down to to Bayshore and then they pump it on up to the 
to the connection at, at, up at SFPUC. And the sewer infrastructure is pipes, lift stations, sewer mains, force mains, manhole covers, and that costs us $5.4 million over the years. Other capital assets are vehicles, sewer monitoring, camera, and the fire hydrants. And I bring all of these forward because what is in our infrastructure, one, is part of our capital projects, and secondly, this is what we have to depreciate, which leads us to depreciation. De depreciation is the historic cost of the asset, or the infrastructure, divided by the life expectancy of that asset. Our water and sewer system has a life expectancy of 65 years, and our current annual depreciation is $632,000. Now, depreciation is not real money, well, it is real money, but it's what, it, what it's designed for is to set some money every year aside so that at the end of the li useful life of the item, of the asset, you have some money set aside to replace it. Unfortunately, we have unfunded accumulated depreciation as of la uh, June of 2010 of $11.6 million. Now the capital improvements, because this also affects our rate, because some of them have to be done. And this is, we've done, what we've done for water from 2002 to present is $4 million worth. Sewer was $4.4 million worth. We have unfunded capital improvement projects of $12.7 million for water and $8.5 million for sewer. We have some CIPs that we hope to be developed, that a developer will fund to the tune of 4.2 for water and only 392,000 for sewer, for a total of unfunded projects of 21 million for water, 13 for sewer. The complete, these, this is a list of the completed water capital projects. They were funded by connection fees, bond issues, federal grants, and some rates. The unfunded water based on the 2003 master plan ranking and the 2003 cost estimate is listed here. We have everything from fire main improvements and, and the Annis Avenue pressure reducing valves up to the, the pipeline replacement beyond its design line of $5 million. So it's, it's rather all inclusive. The potential developer funded CIP is a water main installation in the aqueduct zone and the storage installation. The completed sewer capital projects, again, were, were the big one was the Valley Drive lift station funded by the bond issue and, and some by redevelopment. We have connection fees, more federal grants, and a few rates. The unfunded sewer or sewer capital projects is the 2013 sewer master plan, which needs to be updated down to, again, pipeline replacement. The potential developer-funded sewer was this is a Sierra Point lift station improvement. And we did transfer the Hitachi lift station from us to the, pro to the private property owners several years ago. So that got written off the books. Next that affects the costs is our services, our, our indirect costs, which are services from the city council, city mayor, finance, city attorney. This would be comparable to, to a private company with their board of directors, their finance department, their legal, their all their administrative overhead. And we, we base ours on a base, uh, based on the ratio of the budget. Then our community expectations is assistance with high water bills and tracking the source of any leaks. Our, our guys will go out and assist. We, they don't go into the house, but they will help the customer look at their meter and see if they have everything turned off, if, if it's still running. Because if it is, then, then they need to hire a plumber to bring them in. We have due date notification on signboards. We hand deliver late notices. We have special envelopes for our late notices, and we have low income assistance. And all of this is the community support and service that our department has because we are small enough to be able to do this. If we were a larger larger company, you don't have quite the personal service that you have in Brisbane. Now the components of the utility bill, we have a service readiness charge for water, we have water usage, we have a service readiness charge for sewer, and then the sewer processing charge which is based on water usage and the winter average for residents. 
Now the readiness charge just means that you have everything in place so that when you turn on the, the faucet, water comes out of it, and when you flush the toilet, it goes down in the sewer rather than out into the, the, the lagoon or the bay. Water readiness costs are predominantly your overhead, your pipelines and people. Certain costs are constant, and unfortunately, the fewer number of customers, the higher that price. And I, our administrative services director used an analogy a couple of weeks ago of if you open a store and only sell one product, or only have one product to sell, you have to charge your one and only customer the entire amount. Whereas if you have a lot of customers, you get to split that price or that cost among all, all the customers. And under the, the laws of accounting in probably the state, each customer class, so our residential, our commercial, and our irrigation must, each, must pay for itself. You can't have commercial subsidizing residential. <clears throat> and again, it's often referred to as pipelines and people. And once again, the conservation, we, we love the fact that everyone conserves money. SFPUC loves the fact that everyone conserves water, but it also means that they have less revenue. And less revenue means higher rates needed to cover their fixed costs. Ironically, the people on the peninsula have been so good at conserving water that every city has reported that they're running into the same, same problem, that their fixed rates are no longer co cover the costs of doing business, so they've had, so as people use less water, they've had to raise their rates. Other considerations that we've, that the subcommittee has had us do over the years is look to have, you know, have Cal Water take over. Um, Cal Water has rates set by the California Public Utilities Commission. It earns a modest return on the funds it invests in infrastructure, and we already saw that we have $34 million worth of infrastructure that needs to be done. And major costs to operate a water system include purchased electric power, purchased water, treatment costs, groundwater pumping fees, labor, and chemicals. I found it ironic that Cal Water also has to purchase their water from SFPUC. We also were asked to look at shared services with neighboring cities. We talked to Daly City, we talked to South San Francisco. It didn't really appear that it would be a cost savings either way, so that was kind of af after the first initial attempts at, at talking about it, it was tabled. Another thing that we have going for us is the reduced rates contracts. GVMID has a contract from the early 19th century. No, early 20th century. Of 19th. 12, yeah, it has to be the 20th century. 19th, actually. Is it the 19th? Yeah. Okay. Okay, 12, 12 and a half cents per unit up to 12,000 units a month, which is at turnout two, and this is public work speak. And it's maxed out during the summer, and with one of the capital projects we had, it's now managed in the winter for the best possible results. Because of head loss, you can never get 100% during the winter. Turnout number three also has a reduced rate and is always maxed out. It has the same reduced rate of 12.5 cents per unit, but it's a variable cap depending on the month. And these reduced rates are included in our projected water costs. The other more recent thing we, we need to be concerned about is our bond covenants. In 2002, we issued a bond for $4.4 million, and it was used to finance capital improvement projects. The debt service is paid by water and sewer rates, and the rate covenant states that we must produce sufficient gross revenues that net revenue is at least 1.25 times the installment payment coming due. If it's insufficient, we must notify the trustee and employ an independent consultant to make recommendations to produce the required revenues, and, those require, and we are required to implement those recommendations. If we don't have this rate increase, we start running into a little bit of problem with having the 1.25 times rate. Now, I've also been asked to, to look at our neighbor's rates, and what I did is I converted everything to a bi-monthly figure, because, and, and these are rates taken from the city's websites. So how accurate they are. I also, rather than figure out what every city's average was or even applying our average to theirs, I'm basing, I'm listing it in the water readiness order, showing the usage rate, the sewer readiness rate if I could find it, and the usage rate for sewer. Now what's interesting is that some of the cities put the 
Oops. Wendy, what I do? You're okay. Oh, okay. Um, for the cities, the, the sewer bill or the sewer rate is on their tax bill. So that when customers, when, when our customers compare their, their water bill or their utility bill to say South San Francisco, South San Francisco doesn't have their sewer on the bill. Therefore, they're comparing two different, they're not comparing apples to apples. Our water readiness rate is not too bad. Where we take the hit is in the water usage rate. We have some of the highest rates and, and the biggest number of steps. And that was done deliberately because we're trying to get people to conserve water. Our sewer readiness fee is falls in the middle. And again, we are the only one that seems to have a tiered system. And it is, and, and a number of them are based on the winter average. Now I did try to find San Francisco's rate. And this is what I found on the website. And I find it kind of interesting. Their water readiness is $14. And then they just have two tiers of usage. And I couldn't find a, a sewer readiness at all and their usage rate was 7.16 cents per unit. So that means everybody else is paying for San Francisco. Well, they, they would probably deny that, but it sure seems that way to me. That sure is. Okay. One more time on the water rates history. We had an a increase in, from 02 to 03. We had three increases in 0405. We had an increase in 0506. We skipped 0607. We had an increase in 0708. We had another increase in 0809, and we haven't had one since. So we're playing catch up again a little bit. And we have the same series of in the history uh, sewer. So when we sent out the Prop 218 letter, we thought the increase for the water purchase was going to be 41.2 percent, and the increase in wastewater processing would be 5 percent. And to show you some of the volatility that's been happening this year, because this is the first year that they've actually started construction on, on the Hetch Hetchy pipeline, is in February, the San Francisco PUC proposed changing the rate structure, and that proposal was dropped. Also in February, they stated that their historical rate structure would require wholesale rates between 42 and 60 percent. In April, they proposed a 47.4 percent rate increase to 2.8 cents per cubic foot or 100 cubic feet and it would be increased mid-year if sales drop below 130 million gallons per day. In May they finally passed the 38.4 percent increase to 263 and that's going to be increased mid-year if sales drop below 135 million gallons per day. So they, they will, if we conserve too much, which doesn't mean that we want you to go out and water things too, bit, too much, but our, our rates to us will go up again. So what we propose this year, well, raising the rates this year, we have the increase from SFPUC. We needed to capture the 15.2% increases from prior years, the sewer increase of 5% for next year, plus capturing the 6% from prior years, led us to recommending a 7% increase in the water readiness charge, a 35% increase in the water usage rates, and a 4% increase in sewer. This is how the costs stack up. We have almost 65% of our budget in fixed cost. We have the next tier in water purchases, a little bit more in sewer processing, and a teeny tiny bit in other utility costs. The proposed and the current for the 5 eighths and the 3 quarter inch meters, because that's what most of our residents use, and this is just the, the residential rates, is going from 62 to 78 for, for, for our average, assuming that our average, cust or our, the average for our customers is 10 units, it's the $78, plus the increase in sewer, which makes it just under $20 every two months for water and sewer for the average customer. For a person using one unit of water, it would be a $4 every two, every two months. So as our 
as we look at things now, as without the rate increase, we are short by $410,000. With the rate increase, because we had proposed the 47.2% rate increase, we have an overage of $100,000 that we strongly recommend that you start setting aside to, to fund the accumulated depreciation so that when we have all the, when we have to replace the f pipelines in the, in the coming years, we'll have some money set aside to be able to do that. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Questions, Council? Yes, please. This was fantastic. Thank this you. is a great uh, overview. Um, so really, bottom line, water usage is high because we conserve more. Water rates are high because we conserve more. Mm -hmm. Well, the water usage rates, yes. Right. OK. At the same time, because we are a small city, small number of people, the cost is higher. Mm -hmm. So with the news about water is going to be very, very expensive and so forth. So there is really no end to this. This is going to be a continuing dilemma for not only for us, for almost all the cities. Espe especially as long as, as they're rebuilding the Hetch Hetchy and that won't, and that's to 2015. So I, I would expect rates to continue climbing, yes. And that's a frustrating rate that San Francisco manages to have their rates. Somebody came from, the, one of the public members came in and they said, well, Brisbane increases the rate, but they don't touch San Francisco. <laughs> they touch them, but not to the extent that we're getting touched. Doesn't look that way. So is there any way they can be audited? Is there, what, what is possible? I, that I, I don't really know. The Public Utilities Commission is supposedly an independent commission set to look at, at the water and sewer. I don't know. I did not look into how they are elected or appointed or who, 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 ha who they're accountable to. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, could I offer some help for, yes, for Ms. Cooper? Sure. Yes, so. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm sure Mayor Bologoff can, can step in on this too because he and I both sit on the Barrier Water Supply Conservation Agency and were previously involved with its predecessor agency, the Barrier Water Utilities Association. And really, that agency was formed for two reasons. Uh, one of them was because SFPUC was not recognizing the right to water that the suburban peninsula customers had, which w dates as far back to the Raker Act, which is the early 1900s. And the other reason it was formed was because they were just going to raise the rates any dang way they wanted. And, and without us having any input on it. So those two agencies were formed. There's a bunch of legislation that's been passed. Really one of the biggest things that Bowska does for us on a daily basis is ensure that the capital improvement costs are properly allocated and that the daily operating costs are properly allocated. In general, SFPUC consumes one-third of the water that comes out of Hetch Hetchy every day. The Peninsula customers consume two-thirds of it. There is a staff person working at Bowska. That is all he does, is go through those books every day and ensure that those costs are properly allocated. And at the end of the year, what frequently happens is we have what's called a balancing account, where we sit down, we sit down, this is Mr. John Ommel, I, I don't do it. He sits down with his counterparts and they go through and they, they make the adjustments and they say, okay, yes, either we owed you money or you owed us, us money. We had some cousins. Because you can imagine, they've got thousands and thousands of employees in a system that runs across 160 miles that really serves all of the agencies, all 27 agencies, if you will, at the same time. So it's complex. It's not that anyone, I think, is trying to be nefarious or trying to steal money. It's just very difficult sometimes to keep all those accounts straight. But, but that is done for us. And that's why we continue to belong to Bowska. So would you please explain what Bosco is for people who do not know? Bowska is the Barrier Water Supply and Conservation Agency. It was formed approximately seven years ago. It was the result of three pieces of legislation that came about. Prior to Bowska coming about, the, the peninsula customers is the term I use because that's how SFPUC often refers to us, is where those folks that are down on the peninsula, not up, not up at the end of the peninsula, um, we get our water from SFPUC. And when we were all loosely put together in BAWA, which is an organization that came about 
in the 1980s a result of Redwood City initiating a lawsuit against SFPUC because of the, the proposed rate increase that I alluded to earlier. But then later on what we were finding is that Bauska and its executive management was very, very concerned that SFPUC was not maintaining the Hetch Hetchy system. And there was a report that was commissioned that, and, and I'm, and I'm, I'm going to get the number wrong if I say it, but the economic damage alone from not having water of a catastrophic failure on those pipelines at service would be in the trillions. And a large percent of that was unrecoverable because there are certain types of businesses that once you're out of business for more than a month, you just never come back. And so it would have been a devastating damage to this area. So as a result of that, um, there were a number of legislatures that got involved. I think it was Mr. Ira Ruskin out of Redwood City, who was one of the local council members that, that got the state officials involved. And they passed a number of acts that officially formed Bauska and gave it authority and gave it some legal standing vis-a-vis -vis SFPUC, but also mandated the capital improvement program, which if you, if you read the papers, and I do because I'm an engineer, and I see the, the, the WESIP, the Water Supply Improvement Program, that's the $4.5 billion uh, program that Betsy was talking about earlier. Is that enough, ma'am? Perfect. Cover? Thank you. Okay. May I just one more, if I may? Please. Um, so Brisbane allowance is about a million. Uh. Right. So let's say if we increase our usage to get a lower rate, <laughs> would we be penalized because the cap is set million? They're not going to increase it. Correct. I think I'm going to pass this one to Randy if he has an answer. It, it, it's an interesting theoretical question, uh, ma'am. And part of the challenge is that, um, unfortunately, with water, I, I can't turn to the person nearest to me in the audience and say, hey, you know what? I'm planning my rates for next year. I need to know exactly how much water you're going to need next year, and I need to know how much that's going to be per day, and I'll guarantee you that much, but not a drop more. And by the way, this is a take-or-pay program. Because I've got to have people on staff, and I've got to prepare things, and I've got to buy chemicals, and so even if you're not going to use that, you're going to you're going to pay for it. That that's an incredibly difficult proposition. So what we are trying to do is look forward, and guesstimate based on past usage, based on current trends, what we're going to have. It, realistically, sure. I mean, if if we knew that our water rates were trend, or that our water usage rather was trending up, it's conceivable that the rate would not have to be so high. However, in the last 10 years, our average water, you, you were right earlier when you mentioned to Betsy, we are allotted, call it 1 million gallons a day, because that's a nice round number to work with. We are allotted that much under our two contracts with SFPUC. When I first got here back in 01, we were using 750,000 gallons a day. We're down to 550,000 gallons a day right now. But the reality is all the conversations we've had, and we've had these conversations with Cal Water, we've had these conversations with our neighbors, you couldn't run our system with any less people. In fact, most people would argue that we're short right now as it is because it, having only three people on a crew doesn't really allow you anybody to be on vacation or on leave or additional training without swapping the labor that we do back and forth from our other crews. So in theory, you're, the answer to your question is yes, but in practice, I don't see how you could really implement it and, and get what you're trying to, to accomplish, which is keeping the rates down. I, I just wanted to also thank the subcommittee um, because this wasn't an easy decision. Uh, you hear me all the time complain about this. I pay $20 for water. One person, I pay $60 or $80 for sewer. Believe me, I don't stand by the toilet and keep flushing it to, to pay so much. But... It's the way it is, and I thank you for the hard work that you guys did. An excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Any, any other questions? I'm ready to open up public hearing here from the public. Okay, we have, an, oh, we have a second. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The public hearing is open. I have one slip from Mr. Sarkis and Zadian. Is that it? If I... If I mispronounced it, I deeply apologize. Thank you. I came uh, to protest today, you, but you, the more you, I listen, excuse me? You can correct it by telling us your name. <laughs> Sarkis? That's Khan Zadian. You did better than I did. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, I, I mean, I just in general wish to protest that the rates are going up, but uh, the more I listened, I realized that we're in a trap, apparently, all of us. I have a suggestion that we might depart uh, from the use of water to transport sewage. After all, it is a pure liquid, and then we pollute it, and then we think we're going to clean it, and then frogs get a lot of legs, more than they're supposed to have. So I su uh, suggest that we, uh, you know, create some jobs. We have the collection system. We use water uh, for uh, cooking and bathing and drinking, but we don't use it to transport waste. So then we'd have a certain percentage of that chart up there could disappear. And perhaps we could introduce a liquid that was more efficient in transporting the waste and keeping it separated. So then at the collection station, it'd be easier to separate, and we're saving a lot of water. Now, as far as maintaining this system, I don't see how it should cost so much to maintain the valves. They last for a long time. They operate. They should introduce uh, perhaps uh, solar-powered uh, systems so that we don't have to buy electricity so much. Because as it is, the handwriting's on the wall. There's only so many P's on the table. They can only carve up so much of those, so they have to make up the shortfall. And you see it all across the board. Today it's about water and sewer, it's about insurance, it's about health care, it's about all those things. And it's about the economy in general. Uh, that's my suggestion, but I protest that the rates are going up because nobody's got any ideas on how to rectify these escalating costs on all fronts. Unfortunately, the country's not producing any products, everyone else is in other parts of the world. So as soon as we can talk to the politicians that are uh, passing and making laws, then we should have these American companies come back to this country and open up factories and then uh, put people to work and then we can start uh, purchasing and making money and then taxes will go up and everybody can go back to the happy level that they all were before, perhaps. That's about all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there any, I, that's the only slip I have. Is there anyone else? Yes, please, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Dana Dilworth, resident. Um, I'm wondering what happened to looking for grants and seeking funds from county and other uh, officials rather than continually um, rolling these um, rates, which I actually consider to be a tax rather than a fee, um, keep rolling them over into um, the, making the citizens pay for it. Um, if the project, and if I remember correctly, this 300% of our water bill was based on a build out of Brisbane, a full build out of Brisbane. And clearly that's not happening in this period of time, that um, this 300% increase in our water and sewer rates is too big of a project and too big of a burden to require the citizens to prepare, pay for it. And in my objections before when it started, that the Sierra Point lift station should be borne by, the cost of it should be borne by the redevelopment agency, not the citizens, or not the residents. Um, since 65% of your costs are fixed costs, I think you need to look at the fixed costs. Every year you go through a um, budget review and you adjust to the, um, ability to pay at the time and perhaps your fixed costs now that you have fewer people in all of the positions that were mentioned that get paid for out of our water bill um, that those fixed costs can be looked at in a way to reduce them in the way that this gentleman spoke of in a number of different ways but to sit back and continue to raise um, our uh, fees in order to cover overhead, which seems pretty extravagant at this point, and given the situation um, of the economics of our time, 
Um, so I would suggest that you review the recommendations that came from you from the earlier planner and um, determine whether indeed this is the right inc incremental step. It still seems to be a great burden on the public and, and I believe that alternatives to raising this money should be sought. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. Is there anyone else? Please. Linda Salmon, you know where to find me. <laughs> um, <You're in> Linda. <clears throat> the rates keep going up and up and up and up. I don't know. I'm looking at all this accounting up here, and, and to me, I, I, I don't see the totals and how it really comes out in terms of adding it up, but it seems to me I saw that five, I think it was $5 million for replacing things twice. I don't know. It shouldn't be there twice. It should be only there once. Um, maybe it was just the sleight of hand. It just showed up again for some reason or another. And um, I think uh, What's your name? Betsy said something about um, the the uh, development people cannot pay uh, reimburse the city for water for the uh, individual residents. But it seems to me that <laughs> the burden is falling on us for all of these big developments, and at least from the way I saw the numbers. And I don't like that. Um, I think that's enough of that. The other thing that continues to happen is that we are ignoring our own water resources here in Brisbane, specifically um, the, uh, the water that uh, comes off the springs at the quarry. And I'm saying it once again, over and over again, when it comes to a real catastrophe, if we haven't figured out how to tap into that water, we are in deep trouble. So as far as getting uh, raising the rates high enough to have an excess of $100,000, I say let's recalculate because um, set-asides never get used for, it's not like you actually put the money in the bank and draw a little interest on it. It just gets rearranged and rearranged, and let's not rearrange it on the backs of our backs, our residential backs. Let's not do that. If we want to put aside extra cash for something, let's take it from somewhere else, like maybe some people's salaries. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Oh, how are you? Paul Buscal, Brisbane resident. Um, <clears throat> I like what most of what was said about the uh, water system from SFPUC. And the WISUP project mainly is bringing the Bay Division 5 line to the peninsula. But the rest of the water system is as old as it was when it was put in the ground. And that leaves us vulnerable. We only have two pipelines that feed Brisbane. There is a pipeline that comes from South City to the marina that's tied to Brisbane. I believe it's a 12 inch or something. But that's not guaranteed water, nor is SFPUC's water. If something catastrophic happens, they've told the water users we could be out of water for up to 60 days. Brisbane only has a seven-day supply of water, and that's if we don't have fires. That's just normal water usage. So I agree with the rate increases. That's just the cost of doing business, and it's our obligation to support that. But we do, like Linda said, need to look at some of our local water resources to be able to augment SFPUCs in the event of something happening. You know, a spring box that's over there on Industrial Way uh, produces 50 gallons a minute and 1,440 minutes in a day, that's something like 125,000 gallons, I'm not sure, but you know, if we had a handful of spring boxes tied into our water system, that wouldn't even have to be treated. You know, Title 22 says we could boil the water. And the water that protects this community, aside from 
usage for fire is to be able to stay in our houses and flush our toilets. That's what protects the health of a community is to be able to get rid of your waste. So, you know, maybe another water tank tied into a, a system that could be um, solar pumps that pump water up into the tank for emergencies and then have a program in place where we do have water rationing to be able to flush the toilets. So we need to look at that. And I was also pleased to hear that um, we opted out of contracting with some other water company to come in and do our water works because what we need to have is institutional knowledge and our public works people have that institutional knowledge and money can't buy that so I'm grateful that we decided not to do that thank you thank you Bob. anyone else yes sir I'm yeah. Sorry, Michelle. Michelle Salmon, Brisbane resident. I know it's really a tough road to hoe, but water is our most precious and valuable resource next to air, and without it, we can't live. And it's it's not easy, the decision that you're facing with raising the rates, but if there was one thing that we need to invest in in Brisbane, it's clean water supply. And so as much as I just dread paying my ever-increasing water and sewer bill, I did go through the budget line by line, and I looked at it very carefully. I questioned Stuart about different items that I saw that I didn't understand. But I know that we're not, like, squandering money on our sewer and water system. And it's time to pay the piper because we've uh, enjoyed, you know, fairly decent rates many years ago and for a long time. But if we set, if we don't set aside money to take care of the system going forward then what are we leaving as a burden for the next generation? Because, like Paul said, the pipes, some of the pipes laid in the ground are the age they were when they, I mean, they're in the, it wears out. And we do need to be conscious of that. And it is more important than, you know, our city parks and our recreation and a lot of the other amenities that we take for granted uh, over the last several years. But when it comes right down to it, we need water. We need fresh air. And we need to be able to get rid of our waste materials. And those things, the cost of that is way higher, way higher than it was when we were kids. I mean, think about what it just, what it costs just to get rid of daily garbage now compared to when we used to just dump it in the bay. And so it is our responsibility. And I don't want us to get the idea that if we spread it out over more people, that it'll cost less because ultimately it will cost more. And it's a resource that is limited, and we will run out of it eventually. So I do, unfortunately, support the increase in the rates to support the infrastructure that supplies the water to Brisbane. It's critical. So thank you for all of your hard work on that. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Oh, Ron. Ron Kelowna. 81 Paul Avenue. I hadn't planned on speaking on this subject, but it, a couple of things were brought up. And one was, and Seppi mentioned, the if we used more water, increased the rate during periods of low usage, well, another tank that would serve as a reservoir for that kind of capacity during those periods, it could also be placed, and this is going to be a, a problem for some people, it could be placed at an elevation that would provide answer to problems with uh, water pressure throughout the ele higher elevations in the city. It could, so it could use, uh, it would answer several possible problems. So I just thought I'd throw that out. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Anyone else? Terry. Good evening, Council. Um, water rates are really important, and I think it's a, it's an infrastructure. What's our name, Terry? Oh, I'm sorry, Terry O'Connell, <laughs> Brisbane resident. But you look at what we pay for a bottle of water, and every day we'll pay a dollar, two dollars, 
$4. And you average that out on what it would take. How many bottles would we need to pour down our sinks or our toilets to get it to flush? And we're paying more for water than gasoline in a lot of instances. And so people need to take it into context on how our water gets delivered and how we can use it wisely. And I do think that it's, it depends how you purchase it on what it's going to cost you. But the lack, having the infrastructure there is what costs the money. And it, it's important. And I think that the rates going up are in, inevitable and they're going to go up even more. And so I think while we should look into other storage means and looking at ways to reduce the costs, I think it's inevitable that this rate is needed to keep the water system safe and keep us from having to buy it one bottle at a time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? No? I'd like to make a motion to continue the public hearing to August 1st. Second. We have a motion and a second to continue the public hearing to August 1st. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. The ayes have it. I'd like to Great. request uh, staff to put together responses to some of the items that, that were in, in, in writing so that we kind of have a, a com we, we, compilation. We'll certainly do that. Um, Stuart is not going to be here on August 1st, so there's a few things that I think that are specific to um, him. Um, and if you felt okay with it maybe he could just respond orally tonight okay yes. I, th I think that'd be great yeah yeah and let me just say first is you know you know living in town I feel this as well and we are continuously looking for ways to reduce our costs and as Michelle said I'm more than happy to talk with any individual about what the individual components of our rates are uh, one of the issues that was brought up was grants and while uh, congressman Lantos was alive he was very supportive of us and we got over a million dollars in federal grants. Um, unfortunately, the climate in Washington, D.C. has changed um, a little bit, has changed with our congresswoman. But more importantly, I think the climate in D.C. is not to provide grants as what they call earmarks. Earmarks are a bad word in Washington, D.C. And so we cannot get ourselves written into a bill for grants for our water and sewer projects. Um, we would be competing with the rest of the country. And there's the unfortunate thing is a lot of the programs are need-based. So Brisbane, being in the Bay Area, does not have the same needs as rural Tennessee or Montana or Appalachian country. So we do not look as strong of an applicant as others. Uh, there are some state programs that do low-income or low-rate loans. However, given the current environment and interest rates and that it's a, it's a tax-free yield, we oftentimes beat the low rate loans if we need to go out to bond. So it costs us more if we participate in some of the state programs, more than what it would cost us if we did the projects ourselves. We have looked at flip-flopping the fixed cost and the, and the water use charge. And if you noticed, a, lump, a number of the cities and providers have done that. Uh, but what that does, it, it does two things. One, it hurts your wa low water users. So, you know, if you are um, single and elderly and using, and we have some of these, one or two units every two months for water, and we put 65% of the cost into the fixed cost and only 35% into the rates, those people would have increase in their rates. And I don't think that's, you know, it's not been the policy of the city council to try and do that. It also discourages uh, conservation. And I think, you know, we've done a very good job, as Randy has said, in forcing conservation into this town. And as people say, you know, if we conserve, we do have higher rates. But um, if we use more rates, if, if, if our end users use more, our rates would flatten out. I, they will not go down because, as Randy says, there's like $4.5 billion worth of the Hetch Hetchy project. And I've seen projections that the water we buy from Hetch Hetchy could go up to about $10. I think that was the last number I saw. $10 per unit. 
and right now we're in the two to three dollar range. So we're looking at larger increases over the next ten years for that. In the unit, seven hundred and forty-eight gallons. Seven hundred forty-eight gallons. And as Terry said, you know, people are willing to pay a dollar for twenty ounces because you know I drink water out of our machine and it's twenty ounce bottle for a dollar. And a lot of the cost, and I think Sar Sarkis said this, is that we treat water to drinking quality no matter what you do with it. Uh, that's a requirement. We need to provide, you know, drinking water no matter which tap you turn on in your in your house, you could drink that water. I know it seems strange, but you could drink the water out of the tap for the toilet. And I know this seems like a strange thought, but that's the requirement that our city and the country has to provide clean drinking water. So that I mean that's you know, you pay a dollar for twenty ounces and we give you delivered to your house at any moment of the day. Um, 748 gallons for, you know, seven or eight dollars. And, you know, when you look at it like that, it is a good deal. The, uh, you know, the other one that I wanted to talk about just briefly is the hundred thousand dollars for depreciation. You know, every time I see that slide, I do the math in my head. And if we set aside a hundred thousand dollars a year, a hundred years from now, we'll have finally funded our unaccumulated depreciation. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of our pipes, as Betsy said, have already reached their life expectancy. You know, we have capital projects for both water and sewer of about $5 million, which is what, you know, Linda very much did pick up on that. But those are separate pipes, separate systems, um, you know, and over the next 100 years, you can imagine what those costs will be. So if we can only set aside an extra 100000 every year, you know, we'll be 100 years down the road and we'll be not will just be beginning to be able to afford to replace the pipes that are in the ground today. So yeah, I think there's a lot of issues that are, and, you know, a lot of issues that are going on. I appreciate the subcommittee's time, and you know, I do appreciate all the questions that we've had from the community over the years because it really does help us sharpen our pencils to figure out what are the ways that we could look at saving, you know, saving an extra dime. Uh, you know, the big issue, as Randy says, is we've got three people in a crew. Uh, if you have less than that, you know, you, there's a lot of work that can't get done. And if we did go to a separate water provider or a separate sewer provider, we would not have those people in town when an emergency happened. So, you know, late at night, if we have a major water break, we're able to send well over three people there because we've got extra crews in town extra people in town. So I think, you know, we, we will respond more formally in writing, but I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I was able to respond to some of those points. I appreciate that. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, you, we still continue this till August 1st. August 1st. Yeah, right. okay. Thank you very much, Stuart. Okay, our next order of business is public hearing. It's considered appeal of the Planning Commission Denial of design permit 2-11. Use permit UP-711, variance V-211. Time extension is DP-507. Uh, I'm not going to read any further of this, but do we have a staff report? Uh, yes, thank you, Honorable Mayor, members of the council. Um, by way of background, on June of this year, June 23rd, the Planning Commission, by unanimous vote, 4-0, uh, denied a time extension for the above reference cases, uh, the design permit, the use permit, and variance, to implement an office project at Sierra Point, consisted of 438,000 square foot office space in two buildings, and 1,388 parking spaces, including a five-level parking structure. And on about nine acres, um, on the northwest side of Marina Boulevard, easterly of uh, 101. The project was originally approved in uh, 2009, approved by the Planning Commission, appealed at that time, and approved by the Council. Uh, again, the, uh, those uh, approvals expired without the developer uh, project proponent uh, commencing construction, hence they requested the time extension. Uh, staff did recommend approval of the time extension based on the fact that there were no changes in the project design or circumstances surrounding the, the project or city ordinance. Uh, but again, the Planning Commission did deny the time extension request. Uh, that um, denial has been appealed by the uh, project sponsor. 
And so what uh, is before you tonight is consideration of the applicant's appeal of the Planning Commission's denial. Um, again, both the appeal letter are attached along with the minutes, resolution, and Planning Commission uh, staff reports, uh, which explain the uh, Planning Commission's rationale for the denial. Um, so that all uh, uh, advises the Commission, or the Council's uh, desired action is to make a final determination on this appeal. Uh, pursuant to the requirements of the Municipal Code. I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. Questions of staff? Yeah, I, I have yes, a couple. Yes, sir. Um, so, John, um, you know, back in 2009, I was on the Planning Commission, and, and we had an uh, applicant before us, and the Planning Commission had approved uh, their project. Um, I was looking at some of the the minutes from from that meeting and and just wanted to get uh, uh, just just some, some feedback from you um, one of the things that the that the Commission was asking was that um, they were comfortable with the, the $360,000 that would be applied to some future uh, project for alternative energy um, but they also asked the applicant to to provide you know to stub out uh, uh, the parking structure and, and the applicants said they were comfortable w with doing that <clears throat> excuse me is that was that part of the conditions of approval that went yes okay. and then um the other one was um uh, we talked about uh installing uh, plug-in options in the in the parking garage um, was that also part of the conditions of approval for this that's time? correct okay and then um, let's see we <clears throat> we talked about uh, trying to enhance uh, you know to do a cleanup of uh, some of the debris that is outside of their their property um, and the the applicant at the time mr. Ackerman and said that he was willing to to explore that uh, was that part of the conditions of yeah I think the precise wording was make a good faith effort because it was off-site and uh, they couldn't guarantee that the off-site property owner would allow them to and then that's the state that's correct mm -hmm. all right all right um, that, that is it mr. Matt. I'm sorry can I ask a question sure. he said I don't have any is he finished <laughs> I am. Yeah, okay, please go ahead. Um, we had a letter that asked this question about what's the impact of state taking redevelopment? What is the impact on this project? I, I was looking for the city manager. He stepped out at the wrong time. Uh, maybe the right time. <laughs> or maybe the right time. <laughs> <laughs> There's an item later on your agenda about redevelopment. Yes. Um, there's a two-part issue going on with this is that you know the redevelop the legislature passed a bill to eliminate redevelopment unless the city de voluntarily gives money to underlying districts um, the recommendation from staff is going to be that we um, vol quote unquote voluntarily give money to the underlying districts um, so in the first year there was going to be about somewhere between a 1.3 and 2.2 million dollar take um, but overall from that perspective there would be no there's no fun, real finan there's no financial money going in from redevelopment into, into this project so there's no impact I mean there's impacts on redevelopment and other types of issues but there's no money coming from the redevelopment agency into this project does that well, if that's yeah. that's what um, and I, I have one last one, if I may. Again, in the letter, talked about when the state suspended the emerging uh, renewable um, program. How would that impact this project? Be of that letter. I don't um, know if I have a. Copy, so I'm not quite. You can respond to it later. Doesn't okay. matter. But I was just curious, knowing about 
that particular item with the state okay. in order to see if it had an impact. Okay. We can respond later. You you left at the you left at the quite the right time, Clay. Do you want him to respond? There was a question about a letter that was received no. concerning okay. the renewable energy um, from the state. Okay. We'll respond later. Yeah, respond later. Okay. Okay. They can respond later. Thank you. It's ready to open the public hearing. Okay. Second. A motion is second to open the public hearing. Uh, the first slip I have is Linda Sam. No? You want to vote on it? Vote on opening the public hearing? Yes, we do. I don't even think we need a vote, do we? Uh, yeah. Just open. All in favor? Aye. 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 But okay. Deem it open. <laughs> First slip I have is Linda Salmon on Sierra Point Office Project. Gee, I'm surprised I'm your first slip. I just gave it to you. <laughs> um, when I look at this project, this was one that was kind of uh, pushed through uh, and we were, we were still talking about, well, we're working on our general plan, which by the way, the new general plan still hasn't happened. Um, there were a lot of things uh, pushed through on this one that uh, I think a number of people of the community had serious doubts about. One of the issues that I have in terms of more development out there is uh, transportation connecting um, the Sierra Point to the rest of Brisbane in terms of public transport uh, and fewer cars going out there in terms of the impacts there. I have a lot of issues um, about um, again, rebuilding about the land swap that was going on, uh, <coughs> all kinds of stuff. Um, and quite frankly, I think the uh, Planning Commission is setting a very good precedent. If people aren't going to build in the time um, that was allotted them, then the whole thing needs to be revisited because life keeps changing. And uh, in terms of global warming, we're even more certain now that it's happening than we were in 2009. So I am uh, very grateful, actually, that they asked um, for the whole thing to be revisited and, and looked at again. And I think that's how it should be. I don't want us to get in any more situations like we did on the Northeast Ridge, where conditions, things were approved in 1989. And we saw how they drug their hills on the build, build out because um, the market was uh, out. And the same thing is going to happen on the Northeast Ridge right now in the new program that was developed because they're not doing anything uh, over there. And I would just as soon, uh, when it comes time to renew that permit, that it also be denied and that we go through the whole process again. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any more slips. Who wants to? Speak on it, please, Dana. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, and Dana Dilworth, resident and um, whatever. <laughs> um, we applauded the Planning Commission when they acted in the public's interest by denying the extension of design permits, parking variances, and the use permit, previous, which previously allowed the fragmentation of the property at 3000 Marina Boulevard to become subdivided into three. Asking the developer to go back to the drawing table was the Planning Commission's only option, given that their concerns for public safety and the environment haven't been met, and that sufficient changes in the environment and economic conditions warrant a new design. The argument that there aren't any new laws to protect the public's interest, that the laws that we do have that require higher energy efficiency don't apply here due to previous agreements, and that there is no need to require a thorough review of the changes in, in the law or environmental circumstances since its adoption are specious at best and off unlawful at a minimum. You are required by CEQA to look at all new and cumulative impacts. You are required to ask how the recent state decision to disband redevelopment agencies has an impact. May Please I, don't tell us there is excuse none. Excuse me, may I interrupt one second? I'm uh, putting my letter into the record, thank you. 
so that the public may hear it. You are required to ask about the recent state decision to, sus to suspend the Emerging Renewables Amp program and how picking up the slack is essential. You are required to ask about San Francisco's changes to Executive Park. You're required to put this plan in the context of all new reports that indicate the decline of fishing populations, the decline of migratory and local bird populations, and the decline of open space. And the city's report states that I only spoke to the in, um, issues that were on my letter. I actually had mentioned that I personally get about 40 emails a day that represent new programs, um, new findings, new studies about the environment that we're totally ignoring um, as um, being um, issues that we need to uh, keep in mind when we're considering development. We are in a situation where you are admitting to inadequate laws. The public asks for a moratorium on development until adequate laws, adequate design guidelines that are acceptable to the public, and an updated general plan have been enacted to protect the public's resources of clean air, clean water, open space, and a livable community. To understand this project, we ask that you admit into the records the meetings that prompted this land swap and cite the EIR and mitigations that you claim acknowledges these impacts. At bare minimum, you should require an independent study of the wildlife habitat on this land and the adjacent and the lands adjacent to this property. In a statement by Huey D. Johnson, founder of Resource Renewal Institute, he states that some public assets are so valuable to the health and equity of society that they cannot be sold or given away. We are not willing to give away the resources of clean air, clean water, wildlife habitat, and public safety. You're being asked to support your appointed commission's decision. So please deny the appeal. Thank you. Michelle? Yes, Michelle Salmon, Brisbane resident. I was very unhappy two years ago when the Planning Commission uh, approved this uh, permit. And I understood the circumstances at the time, and they made as many concessions as were possible. Um, but one of the things that really disturbed me at the time was they, they used the biotech project as a precedent for the design guidelines and, and specifications at Sierra Point, which were already at that time out of date, and now they're two years further out of date. And so I also applauded the Planning Commission's courage, even in the face of threats from the uh, developer's attorney, um, to go ahead and deny the uh, um, deny the extension. And I, I sat through the meeting and I read all the documents. And Cliff, in, in here it doesn't say anything about them stubbing it out for electric cars or anything. It only says stubbing it out for solar panels to the extent feasible. And it doesn't say anything about them having to, uh, at least I couldn't find it, and it doesn't say anything about them having to um, uh, assure a secondary egress uh, in the case of emergency. It just said that they would make a good faith effort, which apparently did not come to fruition. I think circumstances have changed dramatically from the time that this was first initiated and certainly even from the time that it was approved. And I think that because the developer did not move forward with it in the two years granted to them, that we have an opportunity now to make this right. Right now we can see it, with the situation with our water and sewer, the constraints that are put on our infrastructure. Our infrastructure for energy is also going to be constrained in the same way. And what you have here for a design and for a development is completely inadequate under today's standards. And five years down the road, it's going to be completely antiquated. By the time they finish it, it will be a dinosaur, an energy-sucking dinosaur. And we granted them one garage for two buildings. That was a huge uh, variance for them. And in doing that, 
and the way that this is laid out, we have all we've we've cut off the opportunity for for energy generation in terms of solar power. Three hundred and sixty thousand dollars for some energy project elsewhere is really a drop in the bucket, as you can see when you look at the finances involved in, in developing and maintaining infrastructure. And we have not met our responsibilities for Sierra Point in terms of design guidelines and development contracts. And I think that the council has a responsibility to the public to take this opportunity to set things right ask the developer to go back and make things right and come back with a proposal that meets the needs of the future and not considerations of the past. And, and I ask you to show the same level of courage as your well-appointed planning commission and the same level of thoughtfulness in going back and ensuring a better future by requiring it now that we do the right thing make this at least an energy neutral development and not some antiquated energy sucking building with inadequate parking inadequate uh, um, it's just inadequate all the way around so please I urge you to do the right thing and go back ask these people to go back to the drawing board and bring something back that Brisbane and that they can be proud of going into the future thank you Terry? Terry O'Connell, Brisbane resident. I too sat and watched this get approved two years ago, and I listened to the um, application to have the permit renewed. We can do better. We can make them do better. We can make them actually commit to energy production. We can ask them to orient their buildings so they're not shaded and preclude the generation of solar power. We can make them get secondary access. If that freeway goes down, if there's an earthquake or some other catastrophic event, we need to be able to get people away from the freeway and away from the landfill area. And that doesn't, there is no guarantee that there'll be a secondary access. There's, we'll try to get an approval for a footpath to be used. doesn't say they will. We want to make sure that they will do the things instead of just trying to do things. And I think that with any development, we can't just continually add on time onto their permit and add on time because we won't have a project that's with the times when it finally gets built. So I think we need to look at the Take the trying out of this permit and put the action in it where we get some energy sustainability and we get a better project because Brisbane deserves a better project. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I have a hand in the back. Dennis Bussey. Good evening, uh, Dennis Bussey, Brisbane resident, 30 plus years. I spent over two hours today walking the entire creek bed parallel to the freeway, starting from the Unisys building, it's now called Hitachi. There's a pond that a blue heron lives in. I cleaned that out 10 years ago. You may recall who worked for the city, uh, uh, Irene Oliver. Irene Oliver came to me years ago, 10 years ago about, <clears throat> and said, Dennis, would you speak for me? I'm afraid of Council, in regards to that creek bed, I said, I will gladly do it, but let's go out and see what your concern is. She always walked her dog there for 100 years. I hope Irene is still with us, by the way. Uh, and I walked it with she and her dog, and there were tires. They weren't from pickup trucks or cars. They were from construction equipment. There was a, a pipe, a corrugated metal pipe, probably two foot diameter, 10 foot sections. It was deplorable. That was all from the construction of Unisys or Good Guys or whoever, uh, Walmart. I don't know where it came from, but it was obviously construction. <clears throat> I brought that to your attention 
and I got the runaround, understandably that, well, that's California state highways, this is the fish and game, this is so-and-so's, we have no say in it. On those minutes which you can look up, I said, I will be there, and I'm going to clean it up, so if you want to bust me, now's the chance to do it. So a buddy and I, it was around Lagoon Cleanup, I made up a 20-foot pole with a hook, and he and I, we were younger and stronger, pulled tires and that 10-foot length of pipe out and took it up to the edge of the Unisys building. And it was deplorable. So I walked it today, the same exact route. I didn't see the blue heron. I saw some other wildlife. But there's still some giant tires, which reminded me I couldn't get them out. I'd need a winch. But it made me think, and there's stuff thrown off the freeway. Please, somebody walk it. It's deplorable. If this should go through, and hopefully not, maybe there can be a requirement they've got to clean it up. It's disgusting. And it's in our own backyard. And if, if it's not our jurisdiction, certainly someone in this building can put the screws or pressure to the appropriate panel like you're trying to stop your airplanes. Uh, <clears throat> the last thing I want to say is... The bottleneck coming in, I stood there. There's two, two bridges. There's choo-choo train tracks. There's one lane each way. One head-on collision, one catastrophe, one thing coming down. A train derails, a high-speed rail go through there at 100 miles an hour. It's a catastrophe waiting to happen. A bottleneck like that. Walk it, park, get out and look. There's nothing should go on out on that CR point till something's addressed for safety. And the last thing I'll leave you with, those of you old enough, mature enough, not you, Cliff, may recall Herb Cain. <laughs> Herb Cain was a great humorous columnist of the San Francisco Chronicle. And my office shop used to be near the Bank of America World Headquarters when it was built. And if you've been there on California Street and Kearney on the, I guess it's the northeast corner, there's a massive piece of art. And Herb Cain named it the Black Heart of Bank of America. And that's what it's known. It looks like a heart, black heart. Today, while doing my thing and walking around, I kept looking at Unisys, which is now says Hitachi. We could come into the entrance of, could be our beautiful Sierra Point, and Unisys will represent the black heart of Brisbane for not planning and thinking it out better by going green and whatever the other people spoke of. So that's my two cents worth. I suggest you all get out and walk it. Good exercise. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Anyone else? Yes? All of them, are you? Paul Buscal, Brisbane resident. I would hope that you'd serve our community by supporting the uh, Planning Commission's decision. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, please. Uh, Michael Warburton, I'm executive director of a group called the Public Trust Alliance. And what our organization does is try to call attention to public duties to um, take care of certain resources in the public interest. Um, as uh, I guess Dana was talking about Huey Johnson's statement, there are some things that are too important for public use that they aren't bought and sold like regular property or given away to developers because they want to develop them. Um, Two years ago, I <laughs> came in and uh, tried to make some comments that um, fill in navigable waters is land held in trust. But something is happening, and the, the sea level is rising. And people know it. And building new stuff on very low-lying areas puts tremendous um, pressure in, in the Bay Conservation and Development Commission has said that they're consulting with the Netherlands um, for um, advice on how to deal with this problem because 
that that's the appropriate people to deal with. It's not. In the Netherlands, everybody in the whole country is sort of below sea level and has an interest in that wall. In California, there's a lot of land above sea level and out of danger. And it's not incumbent on the public to rescue shoreline property owners. And that's what's going to be happening in the Bay. And um, there's a lot of people who say that, OK, that's what everybody's going to do. They're going to decide to rescue um, just irresponsible development in low-lying areas. And um, here's an opportunity where a planning commission has looked at a project and has seen that it is not responsive to the environmental responsibilities of the local jurisdiction. It wasn't responsive when it was approved two years ago. And it's irresponsible and stupid to just keep throwing in. Uh, and several people, <laughs> citizens of Brisbane, have come up and said, hey, let's take a look at this. And these CEQA and these other environmental statutes are not there to stop development. They're to make sure it isn't stupid and not at the public interest. And it would probably um, be far more responsible to go along with public authorities which have examined their public duties and, um, and deny an irresponsible permit. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello, Tom. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. I urge you to back the Planning Commission's denial of the time extension. If Opus did not act in time, they lose. They missed the train. If I don't meet my monthly obligations, the bank doesn't give me an extension of time. They don't say, okay, we'll wait until you come up with the money. And it's not the payment of money that's the issue, it's the action. Opus didn't act in time. They missed the train. They missed the train. Gone. Times are tough for everyone. But they weren't tough 20 years ago when Opus leased other public trust land to build a restaurant. 20 years ago. Do we wait another 20 years for an office complex, renewing the permit every two years? Looks like a catch-22. They don't build a restaurant because of no office buildings, and they don't build office buildings because of no restaurants down there. The economy is not getting any better. And they'll be back in another two years wanting another extension. And in the meanwhile, we'll have another steel junkyard down there with a fence around it blocking more views. If Congress doesn't raise the debt limit soon, the dollar is going to be devalued so much that we're all going to be standing in bread lines. Frankly, I believe there is an intent to deceive you with the perspective rendering on the, on the far lower right. If you supplied me with the money and I could muster up the time, I can draw that and show you that that's wrong. The main issue here, as I and many others see it, is the entire Sierra Point is public trust land, and the city has erroneously sold parts of it. The underlying fact here is, as public trust land, we the public are stakeholders. However, as stakeholders, we, the public, were never invited to participate in the back room 
behind closed doors, sweetheart deals of land swaps, lot line adjustments, and memorandums of understanding. Why should we move forward with faulty, erroneous, and perhaps illegal decisions of the past? The public has raised concerns since day one on this project. The public had to appeal the first Planning Commission's decision, but the public was ignored. Please don't ignore the public that elected you to protect, serve, and be the stewards of our land. Please support the public and your planning commissioners and deny this appeal. Thank you for your consideration and allowing me to speak. Thank you, John. Anyone else? No? Motion, motion to, to close, close the public, public hearing. Here we have a motion and we have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. It's a pleasure, Council. Well, I have a lot of questions, I guess, to, to answer. Um, if I may? Please. And this is probably more legal legal stuff. How? Um, one of the questions that uh, Dan asked is, are we required by CEQA to look at new accumulative impacts around the area in regards to this project? Well, I, I think there was a kind of a CEQA review as part of the extension, but essentially if there's new development, they're required to look at this one, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an existing approval, and if someone was going to come in with a new uh, project, they would have to include this project in their cumulative impact analysis because it already had an approval. Yeah. I think the staff did look at the at the impacts. I mean, there are really no changes. It went through an environmental review at the time, and we didn't see any significant change of circumstances that would require further CEQA review. And and John can correct me on that if I'm if I'm wrong. But. Okay. Um, certainly, hearing uh, hearing everybody, it's not. Uh, doesn't seem to be popular, but uh, in regards to the extension, okay, uh, uh, two years, I guess, uh, is a normal thing. Can you talk a little we, bit about that? Our, our ordinance, the zoning ordinance, does provide for extensions, and I have to say in the past they've, they've been rather routinely granted. There is also a tentative subdivision map that was granted in connection with this project, and the only reason we're here um, is because there was a disconnect between the exp expiration of the tentative map and the expiration of the zoning approvals. The state adopted legislation that automatically extended tentative maps in recognition of the economy and the fact that people were not able to proceed with development in accordance with those maps. The state said, all right, we'll give you more time to do that. Uh, coincidentally, they just did it again. So just recently, the state adopted another uh, law that extended existing tentative maps another two years. So the tentative map that was granted on this project has not expired, and by reason of state action, you know, will not expire for a period of time and now has been extended further. The zoning ordinance, however, um, does not tie the expiration dates of the zoning approvals to the tentative map. So we had the situation of the land use entitlements granted under the zoning ordinance coming up to expiration dates long before the tentative map was due to expire. And, and that's why we, we brought this uh, proceeding for extension, or that's why the applicant applied, I should say, for extension of the zoning approvals. Um, the ordinance does allow for extensions. Uh, and, and there has been, I think, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, they've been granted in the past without not too much difficulty. I think the standard the city has normally applied is has there been a change in the project, has there been a change in, in the circumstances, and in this case is exactly the same project that was originally proposed. That project in itself went beyond the standards that were applicable at the time. So as you know, the city is receiving a, a cash benefit for 
uh, additional and you know uh, energy related improvements and they also agreed to build to a standard which at that time although it was being looked at the city had not yet been adopted so even at the time it was originally improved the project uh, conditions required more than our own ordinances that were in effect at that time uh, would have would have required and so this project is under lead silver and the project is is lead silver now after that approval was granted the city did adopt the green building ordinance that imposed the greens the lead silver standard on a project of this time uh, at the point when this project was approved that ordinance had not yet been adopted mm -hmm. it has in the last two years lead silver been upgraded or is that just doesn't matter I don't think the well lead kind of changes all the time but I, I don't think the standards have have been modified and I, I kind of have to defer to John or, or Tim on that one but there there is lead lead certified which is pretty much the you know the minimum lead silver and the new state you know green building ordinance comes close to that and then there's lean lead gold which is the next step up and uh, I, I don't know of anyone who is is requiring that and very few buildings are even built to lead gold standard yeah the um, well I want to talk about the Planning Commission's uh, action so I mean reading in a staff report you recommended for them not to deny well not allow it or they were asking for more than <laughs> what they they were I mean without disparaging the objectives which are all fine but the fact of the matter is that when we impose conditions of approval we're governed by the law and the law says that your exactions have to be somehow related to the impacts of your development and also based upon the standards that were adopted by the city at the time um, we can expect the developer to abide by the rules uh, what I have a problem with is changing the rules before we've adopted an ordinance to establish a new and higher standard and when the Commission uh, denied on the ground that we can we can get more or has been said tonight we can do better uh, the fact of the matter is um, we, we can impose the maximum requirements uh, established by our own ordinances or by state law but when you say you have to do more and go beyond the building code go beyond the zoning ordinance go beyond our green building ordinance then in effect you're you're requiring an exaction that goes beyond the impact of the development or goes beyond the standards of your own ordinances and it's almost like you're making up the rules as you go along or requiring the applicant to come back with more than the ordinance requires uh, they already agreed to do that before but if we're doing but but it was their their offer not our requirement okay. and uh, if, if we're going to require something uh, we have to play by the rules as well and and our rules are the ones established by our own ordinances and all I was telling the Commission is that you need to work within the framework of the regulations that we have adopted and and that's kind of a limitation you might want more but that doesn't mean we have a legal basis to impose more okay I, I have a question of the applicant but I'd like the rest of the council to get their question answered maybe before we go there because you might have questions too so I, I, oh. I do have things to ask later but I'm interested in hearing from the applicant too so if you have if you don't have any questions yeah. I'd rather let's hear from the applicant yeah yeah um, the applicant um, Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Um, Don Little with Don Little Group on behalf of Sierra Point LLC. Um, Mr. Little, last um, last time, I guess it was a couple years ago, you guys um, voluntarily went to Lead Silver before we adopted that, um, and I guess this this round here seems to be wildly unpopular. Still, I mean, even though. I guess the question is would you be willing to go further than the lead silver well we um, we appealed the matter and I will come directly to to answer your question 
We appealed the matter simply just we we were we were caught off guard um, because the, the the discussion and conversation and requests were so far outside of the rules as we understood them and we had abided by. Um, thus, we're here, and again, we appreciate you know, your valuable time hearing us. Um, I think on you know, Sierra Point LLC, which was the primary owner of the property for many years and has developed it both in Brisbane and South City over over the years, and owns this parcel um, and has a parcel down by the waterfront through a, a ground lease. Um, I think you know, as a, as an aside too, I, I also serve as a as the president of the Property Owners Association, so I'm actively involved in the kind of the community governance down there, and I'm also the head administrator of the Covenants, Conditions, and Restrictions Design Guidelines, so also very much aware of that body of design, which is um, secondary to the cities. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say, um, I'll get to the point, I think we've been a good corporate citizen. We've certainly tried to do the right thing. We've tried to build, you know, good product, good institutional, as we call it. Um, commercial properties that are consistent with the zoning and so forth and to that end um, we would continue to want to be a a partner if you will with the city and if if there's something that is of shared interest and would be um, kind of a, a balanced opportunity um, for all of us um, then I guess you know I would say that we're open to your thoughts and your ideas about what might be suitable and, and satisfactory for this project to continue it's a long way of saying yes. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm not quite sure um, what to ask. Would that mean like you'd be willing to go to lead gold, even though our ordinance doesn't allow that, or not allow it, but uh, all right. huh? Doesn't require. Yeah, it's not required. And I, I don't. You're you're just an exploratory question. I I take it as yeah. such. Um. We have given that some thought. Mm -hmm. um, the other side of the ledger is, you know, there is, you know, the, the state has acknowledged the impact of the, um, the recession on, on business, and that's why they have already extended the tentative map back twice. So, you know, it wasn't that we were uni uniquely um, uninterested in developing. The, the economy has been, been terrible, yeah. and even the state laws acknowledge that. But um, I, would, I would tell you that globally, when I step away from this, I, I would like not to be doing this again in two years, should we get to that point and have the, the zoning permit um, run to the end of its, its time. And one thought might be, just ex thinking aloud, would be if, you know, if we would make a, you know, a firm contractual commitment to go to Lead Gold, um, that you know, we would ask you, I guess, to consider, you know, a mechanism whereby we could have a, a longer term of an approval, not two years, um, something further than that. And, you know, without speaking with um, your staff um, this evening about it, you know, a, a development agreement would be one vehicle to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. So one framework of shared interest solution might be we get an extended term through a development agreement we're not asking for any changes in the project in this in this context, just a duration of time, and in return, um, we would um, go to Lead Gold, and if I'm not mistaken, it would be the first Lead Gold um, project in the city of Brisbane if we did that. So, um, just again thinking aloud, I think if if you could give us some consideration for our I think reasonable business needs to want to have a, a development that has a you know a, a firm footing for an extended period of time. I think we could we could return that and honor that with a commitment to take this to the highest level of any project in the city. So, can I ask the city attorney is that is that something that's even doable? I mean, yeah, I think it's doable. I I think the only way I would really be comfortable and as far as the city's interest is concerned is is through a development agreement because we I wouldn't want to do it as a condition of project approval since it's going so far beyond what our our existing ordinance would require but if it's a development agreement where the uh, applicant has 
committed by contract to go to that higher standard, we in turn can can grant a, a longer period of time, which you would normally do under a development agreement anyway. Those agreements are typically used when a project is expected to be extended out over a period of time. The other thing that concerns me about, about the, just the two-year term is that if we're talking about lead gold, then basically there are changes that need to be made to the plans and specifications for the project. And that's going to require time to prepare. It's going to require time to plan, check, and approve on our end to make sure that the lead gold standards have been satisfied. So just the, the time frame of going through the logistics of, of reviewing those plans would, would require some additional time. So mm -hmm. I, I would agree with, the, with Mr. Little that a development agreement is probably a good vehicle to use. Um, so, you know, we, we could proceed on that basis. One, one approach the council could take would be uh, just to make sure that the whole approval doesn't expire is to grant the extension, but with the uh, condition that um, the project be submitted for lead gold and, and that uh, a development agreement be, uh, be signed between the parties. Uh, if we know it's going to require green, lead gold, then that's going to be the standard that we'll be looking for when he comes in for a building permit. So I'm not too worried about you know, it being built with before that standard is achieved. And I think that will at least give us time to put together a proper agreement, have it adopted in, in the usual way. And at the same time, the approval is still there, but it's subject to the project being modified to achieve the lead gold standard. Do, do development agreements have a specified time, or is that just part of the agreement? There is usually a, a, a time frame by which things need to be accomplished. Um, so, yeah, we would, we would try to work out some dates that we think are, are practical, g given what we expect to be the time frames, but we're not limited to the zoning time. And we also need to take into account the tentative map. So I, I think the development agreement would serve the purpose of allowing those times to be determined by us rather than by the state and give us a, enough time to make sure that you know, the, the, the project is revived, the, revised, that the plans are reviewed, and, and give us some time, by us I mean myself and counsel for the developer, to put together a development agreement, although I, I would not expect it to be a terribly complicated document. It would be pretty straightforward. But that would really be the legal basis, uh, because it's being offered by the applicant and become a contractual commitment rather than a legal exaction. So that would really be the legal basis for us to, once it's signed, to say that the applicant is now bound, legally bound, through the contract to build the uh, development in accordance with that standard. The, um, just digressing away from this project, but we have a development agreement with the other approved project out there? Yes, we do. And there were some additional things on the... Um, What's the name of that? HCP, HCP uh, the other project on, on Sierra Point. Uh, there is a development agreement um, with that project, and that was also the basis through which we were able to obtain some additional, you know, public benefits and other, other things that normally could not be imposed as part of the normal subdivision or zoning approval process. That's all the questions I have of Mr. Little. I, I, have, I have a question of, of Hal, or perhaps. Uh, Hal, we talk about silver, we talk about gold. If, if they decide that if you give us X number of years, we will build it to gold, is gold some firm? Some firm gold is a defined Or is standard. it a moving target like all the rest of the zoning? Uh, well, right, you know, LEED has, has certain requirements to meet that standard, and it is a defined standard. Um, with, with it, I'll let John comment on that in more detail. They might, you know, refine it some more, but you know, essentially we do have an identifiable standard, and I'll defer to John as far as... Yeah, I think you'd want to tie it to the current LEED gold, because the all these standards... I know that the, the, the LEED gold that's in effect at the time the development is actually coming in for permit, because what... The lead standards get more restrictive or aggressive, and so you don't want to actually tie it to a standard that's lower than what it might be in the future. I, I think that's uh, something for the council to consider. Right. I believe 
I believe the high level right now is platinum. Mm -hmm. And I have gone to places in San Francisco and have had a tour mm -hmm. of some hotels, some places that is truly pride of that community when they go that level. So I'm really encouraged by the fact that you are showing pride in going beyond um, what is required. Well, thank you. I mean, and it's it's a moving. I, I it is a dynamic change in our our society. You know, become more and more efficient, less and less carbon footprint. Um, and you know, I think it is good stewardship. I think I think we could also rationalize that it it creates value over time for everyone involved, the community, the, the employees, and so forth. So, I, I think it. While people were reluctant at first, I think more and more people are embracing it not as a regulatory mandate, but something that actually makes sense and creates value? One of the questions, a comment that was made, uh, there was, there's a development agreement uh, between HCP and us. And I believe part of that agreement had to do with parking, the access, walkways, and so forth. Um, but that's the detail I remember that uh, residents were really interested in? Do you remember anything about that? Um, yeah, I think there is something in there about that, but there is also the uh, renewable energy component. Of course. That we negotiated in there, dealing with both solar and, and wind power and, and the studies that they're required and the potential offset in terms of uh, money for city projects if, if it doesn't work out to do it on, on site. Okay. Yeah, there was, <clears throat> I think, uh, regards to that project, I believe $1.8 million, but we also know that it's uh, set for a biotech campus, which yes. generally energy hall is in a way, but so there was a, a lot of uh, offsets that would be put there that could be right. um, credits, I guess you'd call them. Right, right, right. Um, and I guess the only point I was making is that the, I agree with John, we would apply the standard as of the time, as is defined as of the time of the permit. The point I was making is that there is a, a standard that can be identified, so we're not just kind of making it up as we go along. We would have, it may not be the same as what is there now, but it would still be defined as lead gold, and that is the standard that we would apply. And would, however that definition is framed as of the time the application for the building permit is made. Okay, Council, what's your pleasure? Uh, I have a couple Oh, I'm of sorry. Uh, Mr. Murr, that's okay. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Little, for uh, making that offer to go lead gold. Um, I know that's not something that is required of you. I know that you're you know, trying to work with the community, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I appreciate that. Um, you know, another uh, th you know, area of, of uh, green building, alternative energy, is that during the, the last uh, go around with the commission, uh, you guys agreed to step out the infrastructure for future um, solar panels? So that you know, allowing someone who might later on down the line, not you, but perhaps a, a tenant, could potentially do that once you know the technology is is more. Uh, palatable to, to do things like that. Well, you know, I, I believe, staff, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that we, our current conditions of development require that we put in place those kind of hard points um, on the parking deck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and it's nice that that's in place. And then, um, and then also the parking, the parking uh, stalls for the plug-in, having the, the five stations yes. at each level, um, you know, that's a, a good thing. That, that goes towards that, that whole theme of, yeah. of trying to be, you know, a really good partner in, you know, reducing your carbon footprint. So uh, I, I think, I think that. that's, that's, that's something that will become more viable with time. It might still be in its early stages, but we're glad to do that. Yes. And, and you know, the other thing was, um, you know, picking up that debris. And I know that it's a tricky, you know, dance that you might have to do with the state. Um, you know, I, I, I hope that, that you're successful in doing that, you know, cleaning up that, that slough and then the area um, around that um, around that waterway because, um, you know, it is a, an area that has an endangered uh, clapper rail bird and, and it would be nice to 
enhance and, that. And I, I would be willing to, to, you know, meet with staff um, or whoever you deemed appropriate um, prior to the development agreement, should we go that way, being executed so we can scope it out and understand what we're up against so it doesn't sound like we're making a, a meaningless gesture by saying we'll, we'll try to do it. Right. But it, it is a little more complex when you have other property owners out there and other people are the ones throwing their debris in there, not us. Sure. But we certainly, um, we will certainly follow up on that. All right, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It was a pleasure, Council. Well, no, it's it's interesting. I know, you know, a lot of folks um, find that this is not a popular project. You know, I know it wasn't two years ago we originally approved it, right. and um, quite frankly, I mean, listening to the city attorney, I think planning commission probably should have approved, done the approval. Yeah hearing it and I know it's probably not the popular thing after hearing from the citizens you know that uh, <clears throat> but the Planning Commission is not the legislative body and has to go by our ordinances shall I take that as a um, your uh... no I, I, I mean uh, looking at it that um, the applicant is willing to go Lee Gold, you know, uh, and do it via development agreement, and I, I would make a motion to, oh, I, I'm not sure what the motion would include here. To deny planning look commission? For, well, look for some what would the proper language be, Hal? <laughs> The, the action then would be to uh, uphold the appeal and then to grant the extension subject to a condition that the applicant uh, enter into a development agreement with the city that provides for um, the project to be built in accordance with the LEED Gold standard applicable as of the time building permits are issued and for the uh, term of the agreement to be some, I, I guess we would have to come back to you on that. I, I really would be a little reluctant to come with a recommendation because I don't know what the timing on all this is. Um, but we can bring a resolution back for uh, adoption by the council, uh, unless the applicant has some thoughts at the moment. But I, I don't know what kind of term to suggest right now on that development agreement. So, Nor do I. yeah, yeah. If that's your motion, I'll second it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I I think what we would be doing, and we what our normal process is on an appeal is based on on the council action. We then at the next meeting bring back a resolution to memorialize that action, and hopefully between now and then, and your next meeting would be August first, we could come back with with some idea as to the term of the development agreement that we would be comfortable recommending. I, I don't want staff to feel that we're um, jammed up against a deadline and, and have to rush the job of approving the plans. And by the same token, I think we all want to have this building properly designed in accordance with, with the LEED Gold standard. So um, I, I guess I'm a little reluctant to commit to a time now that might end up being too short, not only for the applicant, but also for staff. Okay, so what would what would our action? Be? I think the motion would be to uphold the appeal, uh, uh, subject to the condition that a development agreement be executed, providing for the lead gold standard, having a term to be approved by the city council. That would put it at lead gold. Mm. Correct. Right. Yeah, I make that motion. I'll second that motion. Public comment. Motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. No. Yeah. It's up to the up to the chair, Mr. Mayor. What was on the uh, the agenda? We deserve the right to speak to it. Thank you very much. I'd say let him speak. No, you have to notice it. No, this, this is simply a way of disposing. The appeal is on the agenda. 
Uh, the council is, is granting the appeal subject to a condition. There's no new noticing required for this. And, and I should say the, plan, the, the development agreement would have to be approved through the normal process of approving a development agreement, which means it starts with the planning commission. So there would be, there would be public hearings at that point. Okay. The next order of business is. Oh, wait a minute. Was there a motion on that? Yes. Um, there was a. Made a, made a motion. There was a second, but we didn't we didn't vote or have further discussion. So the question is, is we have a motion on the table? Do you want to hear further public testimony no. in regards to this? I don't. No. I don't mind hearing because one of the things that truly we talk about is. Brisbane being a place to be environmentally safe and progressive. I believe the applicant has shown interest in helping us with that. We were the first in the county to have green building ordinance. That, that's leadership. And if we have this gold standard, it is, again, a leadership in the county for our community and so forth. I do realize that there are some people that they are against this. And I was not here in the council many years ago that we had all those places, UNICEF or Hitachi or whatever. But truly, what they built is a source of pride in that area. If we continue doing what is right for our environment, I think it's we are down the line, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we're going to look at those buildings and say, we did a great job for the community. With all of that, but I don't mind hearing from um, a few uh, individuals that indicated that they want to say something. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, you know, taking the testimony. I don't want uh, people being... Could we allow, traded. could we limit it? Could we allow three? Well, I... Yeah, you people. know, um, I heard two notes. <laughs> yes, so sorry. Yeah, you know, I I, I agree with Sebi. So um, what she just said. So I, I wouldn't mind hearing from the public, but I do agree with um, the actions that were taken by the, the applicant, that they were uh, moving us. You know, maybe not as fast as as a lot of folks would like to see, but we're moving towards being more sustainable. In, in our development and um, going to lead gold is uh, is the next step so but if, if people from the public want to speak yes I, I don't have a problem yeah with that. And, and I think yeah okay and but I, I, like, and no, I like, also think that you know we ought to give direction to staff too at some point that right. maybe take a look at our green building ordinance right. and uh, maybe look at bumping it up to the next step, which would be legal. Let me just make one comment, though, because there seems to be some misunderstanding as to what the action is. The action is to direct the staff to prepare a development agreement. It is not to approve the development agreement. It, it is simply giving us guidance as to what the content of that agreement should have, and the condition for the extension is for the project to achieve the lead gold standard. That. Uh, in essence, that's no different than any other project coming before you on an appeal and the council uh, negotiating with the applicant to make certain modifications to the project. You're, you're not starting over again. The council has jurisdiction over the project on the appeal. You have the authority to make modifications. The changes that would be made going to the gold standard will go back to the planning commission. The development agreement will go back to the planning commission. There will be opportunities for further public comment on that document. A development agreement, by its very definition, uh, has to be adopted through uh, a certain process, and it would start with review by the planning commission to make a recommendation to the city council, and then would be adopted by the city council. So. Uh, all you're doing tonight is defining what that process will be. You are not uh, tonight approving the actual agreement. You're just basically giving us guidance as to what the content of that agreement ought to have. And even in that regard, we're, we're still kind of leaving open the term because I think we need some further deliberation on, on what length of time would be appropriate. But, but we are approving the, uh, you're approving, the project being a, a lead gold. You're approving the extension. 
uh, on a, for, but for a period to be determined and for the project to be lead gold. Yes. And, and the only way there would be an extension is if the project is modified to achieve the lead gold standard. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the document itself is not before you and you're not approving that tonight. Correct. So, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to ask if we can listen to get input from at least sure. no more than three. And we have an item in the agenda that there are people waiting patiently to okay. uh, for their turn. So to put a limit of two minutes per those three individuals. Okay. Okay. Uh, where's Dana? Was she going to say? Did you want to say something? Okay. You got okay, um, you got two minutes. You're not going to solve the problem of the world. But. No, no, no. <laughs> this one um, is actually City of San Diego has a lead certified white elephant on uh, Broadway Pier, which is one of the biggest public trust nightmares in California planning today. It is lead certified. Nobody wants to pay for it. It's a cruise ship terminal that... Ex I've been there. What? I've been there. Oh. Nice. <laughs> okay. okay. So, well, so well, the Brisbane, guy, Brisbane well, the will be in competition <laughs> for the two cities with lead certified white elephants in the wrong places with respect to the use of civic space and public access to shoreline areas. And I don't think that's a precedent you want to set. Thank you. Linda? I th my feeling is rather than slap the planning commission in the face and saying, oh, yes, we're just going to approve the appeal, is to simply set that question aside for the time being and direct staff to bring before you what a development agreement might look like and have that reviewed by the Planning Commission. In the meantime, suspend this action because <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is irresponsible to simply approve the appeal on some conditions that are out there. We don't have any time frame. We don't have any kinds of guarantees of what we're looking at. LEED, as far as I know, is already obsolete and they keep trying to redo their things so that they can stay in the running. We really need to look at this carefully. And that, I think, is why the Planning Commission denied the extension. We have to have real figures, real times, real things that we want to talk about. Not just, oh yeah, go for the appeal and then, by the way, we'll come in with a development agreement. A development agreement is a whole other ball of wax. Thank you. Thank you. Last one. Who else? Tom? Uh, we haven't heard from Linda. Yeah. We haven't no. heard from Linda. Yeah, That's the third Linda. person. Sorry, yes. Tom. Michelle. Yeah, um, yes, Michelle, sorry. Like I keep saying Michelle. We've already heard from <laughs> Michelle Salmon, Brisbane resident. I think that we shouldn't be hasty in, in doing this. I think that we should set this aside, really look at the issues both to protect the developer's interests and Brisbane interests, because to just make a decision off the cuff to hold them to a standard that we're not even sure right now that we have confidence in, lead gold, lead platinum. Are we talking about the shell in the core? Are we talking about the entire build out? I mean, what are we really talking about here? And what's the timeline? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? I mean, I remember 27 years ago standing out at the marina going, wow, next year there's going to be a restaurant here. Hot damn. <laughs> Some years later, it's still a pile of dirt. Okay, so uh, these are things that we really need to de decide and define, and, and I don't want you to be rushed into making a decision, and that was part of the basis of why the Planning Commission set this aside and said, no, we're not going to extend this. It really needs a better look, and it really does need a better look. And, I'm, and I, I think the developer is very uh, upfront about saying, you know, hey, we want to look at it too, and you know, we're willing to offer, you know, to to look at it, and and lead gold. I mean, you want to build something you're proud of. You want to leave a legacy that you're not going to look at ten years down the road and go, what a dump. Why why did we do this? You know. So I just caution not to be hasty. Don't 
don't take action. If you can legally not take action tonight, postpone it till you have the parameters defined and on the table that everybody agrees to. Um, I think a reasonable amount of time to do that would be a couple months and maybe three months. I mean, we've waited two years already. What's the rush? Somebody has a, a hole burning in their pocket with a lot of money to develop right now? I don't think so. So let's approach this as a more longer timeline and, and, and do it right this time, both for the developer's sake and for the and for Brisbane's sake. Thank you, Michelle. I was going to, we were, gonna, we were limited to three, but Tom, you wanted to say something. Thank you for allowing me to be number four. <laughs> um, I don't think the issue is silver, gold, platinum. I think the issue is the buildings were not designed for this site. If they were, they would not be seeking variances into the public spaces. That's the issue. It's the whole design. It's not just silver, platinum, gold, pink, blue, whatever. It's the design of the site. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay. So what's the council's pleasure? Well, we have a motion and a second on the table. Um, I voted to approve this two years ago when it was silver, and, you know, I... Yep. Yep. Yeah. It hasn't changed in my mind. I know it's it's it hasn't changed in a lot of folks' mind because you know here we are again, and uh, so you know I was willing to vote for it uh, just to extend it two years, but the applicant willing to bump it up, then I think that uh, I think it's worth it. It even is a better thing. Yes. That at the same time, well. I applaud uh, the planning commission's bravado <clears throat> and, you know, reacting to the public that wasn't within their purview. And I think that you need to remind them that they have their rules and regulations to follow and are not the legislative body so to make those decisions. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Call for question, please. So, question? Call for question. Call the question. Call, oh, call for the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Well, ayes have it. Okay. We got to that one, I think. Okay. All right. Our next order of business is old business. Consider authorizing mayor to execute an agreement to pay processing costs with Semic Angulian and an agreement for consulting services with NBS Government Finance Group. This is the Margaret and Paul Avenue. And I have a whole bunch of, st did you, staff, did you want to say something on this? Yes, sir. I, I think I absolutely need to. Yes, so, sir, please. Well, sorry to extend your evening a little bit. So you've got the original staff report that was prepared for the July 5th meeting, and you'll recall that, that at that time there was some question as to um, which council members might have an interest in, in this um, agreement that we were getting to be brought before you. Um, the city attorney, along with some uh, help from staff, has now determined or is recommending that per the Political Reform Act that four of the five council members recuse themselves. <laughs> So, so that would be everyone except for the mayor, and, and <laughs> so that creates some interesting challenges. But, but I, I, I think the first question I need to ask you is that that is a recommendation from the city attorney. So, may I ask you, do do the four council members who are recommended to be recused, are you all concurring I, with that? You, you know. I think before we go, I, I'd like the city attorney to comment on that, because I think there are three, three, three council members that are. Uh, within the 300 foot limit. 500, so. It's 500. 500 foot limit, sorry. Four. My understanding there are four. 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 Everyone except for you, sir. Three, four, five. Okay. They're within the limit. <laughs> you're the only one who isn't. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not, not there, and you're okay, aren't you? Am I no, okay? no, sir. No, I'm not no okay. sir. Everyone except for you. Except. 
You are the only one that is not. It has not become a kingdom, has it? <laughs> That's, it's, it's a matter of one. So, so now the question becomes, how do we How do we do that, a, city a attorney? That, that's a good question. The, uh, the city attorney has recommended that it be uh, an, a fair mean. And, and I, I have to tell you, this is the first time in my career that I've been asked to bring a deck of playing cards uh, to a council meeting. And I was having trouble keeping them unopened because I was going to play a game of solitaire while we were doing some items that were not on the public works director. So what I'm going to do is open the cards. I'll remove the jokers. I'll then do my best imitation of shuffling them. But let me just say that um, please. It's, what, what we're doing is really under the Political Reform Act, not, not oh, yeah. my the solution that I came up with. But what happens when you Chief have when uh, council members disqualified to the point where you no longer have a quorum, which is the situation we now have, then council members should be selected by some random method the Political Reform Act does not specify what that is. I rejected Randy's rock, scissors thing. Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> rock, paper, scissors. I was going to suggest, suggest that. that. No. But by, by some random Ladies method, you select only enough council members among those who are disqualified to constitute a quorum. So in this case, since we only have one council member who is not disqualified, of the four who are, we need to select two. Once that selection is made, then those two who have been selected would continue to uh, be involved in that matter until uh, either the matter is concluded or the conflict no longer, you know, no longer exists. So this is only the first action related to this matter. And it's not even the approval of the district itself. It's only approval of some contracts to do some preliminary work. But nevertheless, it does involve the, the, the potential district. So if there are later actions that are required uh, by the council, the two council members who are selected tonight would continue to make those decisions uh, in, until such time as, as the matter is concluded. In this case, however, we have another unique little wrinkle on all of this, and that is that there will be an election uh, coming up while this matter well, depending on what you do, but potentially this matter could still be pending and there could be a change on the council. In that event, assuming the person elected <laughs> does not also live within 500 feet, that person would be qualified to serve and we would probably do another drawing, but we'll, we'll worry about that when the time comes. And right now, our, our job is to, uh, by some random method, and we're just doing it by selecting drawing cards, to have two council members uh, uh, appointed uh, to constitute a quorum. The other two then, can, you don't need to leave the room anymore. That rule has been eliminated, but uh, you, you're not allowed to participate in the proceeding. In, in as much as I'm going to be going off the council in November, I, I will, if it's appropriate, volunteer to be one of those council members who does not sit. You, you, I, I don't think there's anything in the Political Reform Act that requires you to participate in the drawing if you would prefer simply to disqualify yourself and, and remain disqualified. I, I would prefer to disqualify myself and remain disqualified. Okay. Well, then we only need to choose, uh, we still need to choose two, but it would be among the remaining three. Among the remaining three. Correct. Right, I, Can I ask a question? Oh. When, they, when they select jury, they have alternate members? <laughs> Do we need to have alternates? Uh, there's nothing in the Political Reform Act that provides for that. It simply says you select the minimum number that's okay. required to constitute a quorum. Um, if yeah. I disqualify myself, does that railroad Seppi and Cliff into this? Yes, yeah, because I already talked about this uh, beforehand. I'm not going to do that, of course. But I, <laughs> I won't have to answer the question. But I, but I agree with you, since Steve's stepping off the council, that that's probably appropriate. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay, sir. We are Would ready you? for the deck of cards. Well, well, I thank you very much for the city attorney giving me the time to, to shuffle the cards. My brother happens to be a pit boss. This is a true story. Back <laughs> at uh, the Mohegan Sun, and it's the largest gambling casino in the state of Connecticut, and he would be deeply embarrassed at the way I, I shuffle cards. The way you shuffle. So what I'll do is I will bring the cards up to the council alphabetically for their members who, who want to remain. Please cut the deck, take the top card where you cut it, and I'll put the cards back together and bring them to the next person. And then the lucky too high 
get to uh, get to participate. And, and we are not we are, we are not taking bets from the audience either. <laughs> 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 uh, I think I can see the bottom card. I will remember that if I ever play cards with you. I saw it. I will never play cards with you. Like I get, I get, I get rejected of a card. Aye. Can you believe oh, that? Okay. You didn't say that. I guess aces should be high. Jack, six, nine of hearts. Jack and nine. He is happy. I so. get out. No. You're out. I want to play. <laughs> so, so actually, um, but I can sit here. No, no, you have to no. step down from the dais. You can sit in the audience. You can sit in the audience, but you can't participate in the conversations. So no. yourself and uh, Councilman might want to put these in a historical yeah, collection. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm Calvin. I don't think that's ever been done before. I my card back in case I need to play South. Yeah, right. <laughs> what did I do? What did you do? You cutting cards? You taking them? Uh, um, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. The hour. I already have Can they uh, take a you sure? minute break? Uh, yeah, let's Working do it. under pressure. Yeah. Okay, let's take five minute break I here while we're doing this. Yeah. Jeez, you just.
Okay, are we ready to go? Yeah. Push it down. Yeah, see what you missed? The, fir huh? the first person that wants oh. hmm. The first person that wants to speak on this Margaret and oh, Paul issue. Can we, uh, Cliff and I didn't even sit through the proceedings last time. Maybe we can kind of get an update of what's going on. <laughs> so, uh, call the meeting to order, Mr. Mayor. Let's call the meeting to order, and, and uh, would you give us an update on how? Sure, sir. Happy to do that. Ha happy to give you a shot at it. So here's the background that leads to the question you have here before you. Effectively, the city's municipal code tells the owner of property on the private roads that we have throughout town that they cannot build on that property until the road is built out to city standards and deeded over in fee to the city because we just we don't allow private roads so it has to be a public road you have to have access from your property all the way back to a public road one of the programs in the 94 general plan encourages the formation of assessment districts to solve these transportation challenges where appropriate that's generally what the language says so the owner of some parcels up on Paul has come to the city and asked us to bring forward to the council two documents. One of them would be an agreement with him where he agrees to pay the costs to consider the assessment district. And the other one that is on the same agenda item, the same staff report, is the actual agreement with the professional consultant who would begin this process. And the, the one thing I'd like to clarify at this point is that beginning this process does not guarantee, does not foretell that an assessment district will be formed. What it does is it gathers information to be put into an engineer's report so that many of the questions that many people in the audience tonight who are here at the last meeting as well have regarding the various difficulties of the project and the actual cost of the project. Now, I think there is obviously a lot of concern about this, and I understand the concern from the neighbors because of these questions. There was some information that was distributed, um, it was by Mr. Ungulian, it was not by staff, in advance of these meetings as he was meeting with his neighbors. And I, I think that information may have caused some of the concern because there are so many points in this process where decisions are to be made by the council. And I believe what Mr. Ungulian was doing was setting forth a proposal, setting forth something for people to consider, to chew over. So I want to be very clear that the boundaries of this district would have to be approved by the city council. Now, you wouldn't approve them in your action tonight, but you would approve them as you were considering accepting the engineer's report. The assessment methodology that would be used would be recommended to you by the consultant. The consultant that uh, we have the agreement for in here is NBS. This is someone who does this on a regular basis. This is the type of business that they do. They are familiar with the various laws that govern this. 
in general, the law regarding Prop 218 tells you that you have to apportion the cost based on the, the apportionment of benefit received by a property. And that also comes to, that also brings you back to a weighted vote. There is more than one way to do that and to stay within the boundaries of the law. And I think that if the council were to consider this favorably tonight, that's one of the directions you ought to give to staff is that you want NBS to prepare more than one assessment methodology for you. There have been questions by the citizens as well as far as, well, who will design the roadways? It would not be Mr. Ungulian that would design the roadways. The roadways would be subject to your city engineer and to the requirements of your municipal code, not to a private developer, because they are, it's a roadway that if it ever does get built in this fashion, it will become a public road. It will go into your roadway system. The city will be responsible for its ongoing operation and maintenance long-term forever. And so we are gonna wanna make sure that it is developed to our standards. <clears throat> there was a, a request made of you at the last meeting that you speak your minds now as to whether you were going to be favorably considering forming this assessment district. And, and I will give you my impression as your city engineer that I think that is an unfair question to ask of you. And the reason I think it's unfair relates directly to the many speculations and concerns and unknowns that the citizens along Margaret and Paul have brought before you, is you just don't really have enough information right now to make an informed decision. You need information to be gathered and you need information to be put to you in a fashion that shows you here's what the actual cost would be, here are some recommended forms of assessing out those costs and assessing out a vote and so forth. And, and then at that point in time, once you've received the engineer's report, you have significant latitude in making decisions as to whether you would then even put it forth to a vote for those parcel owners within that boundary. So that's the reason why staff continues to recommend that you favorably approve these two agreements because we believe that there is plenty of time for consideration, plenty of opportunities for you to inform the way this district might be formed, the way its assessments might be made, and whether or not you want to make a vote on it. And, and one of the items that, that you do have within your discretion and within your leeway is to consider the economic impact of the formation of such a district. If it turns out that the cost of the roadway was, was so large that it would be overly burdensome and overly onerous to all of the property owners, you could use that as one of your reasons to not put it forth to a vote. So I'll, I'll end there and ask the council if you have any more questions for me. I, I just have one. Sir. That's not a city street, right? That is correct, sir. It's presently so privately. There is another process that needs to take place. In other words, the acquiring of that property by whomsoever. That, that's or a true that statement. Part of the, uh, no, that is a true statement, sir. That is really one of the pieces of the equation that we have not brought into play yet uh, because for the development to happen, the roadway would have to be deeded to the city. And, and let me just comment on that because that's kind of one of the big unknowns <coughs> here. Um, a, as you may recall, all of the so-called paper streets up there were owned by the Fern Trust, uh, and some real streets were owned by the Fern Trust, including this one. All of those properties were purchased by one private party, and that party still owns <coughs> this chunk of land. Uh, I have had no contact with, with that party. I don't know whether they're aware of what's being proposed. But unless they want to voluntarily um, convey the property to whoever is going to be involved in, in building a road, even if it's approved, um, part of the assessment process would be you'd have to acquire it in some fashion either voluntarily or through eminent domain, but there would be a cost associated with it, and that's a cost that then would be added to all of the other costs of the project, the cost of constructing a road, then you would have a land acquisition cost. We did mention at the last meeting that if any of the adjacent property owners, if some of their land was needed to, for part of the road right-of-way, uh, to the extent it was uh, dedicated to the city, the value of that land would be a credit against the assessment, 
But as far as the owner of the basic road is concerned, uh, unless that person wants to simply get rid of it to avoid what I think is a continuing liability anyway, there may in fact be a land acquisition cost that would have to be factored into the total project cost. That's one of the things that the consultant would have to look at and find out, and that's one of the considerations that would be taken into account in the decision as to whether this whole thing is even feasible. So at this point, at least staff has no idea what the status of that ownership is and whether that ownership is, is a participant or not. And, and from my point of view, that's kind of one of the, 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 the uh, bull in the china shop in a way because, you know, that, that party, whether, whether she's cooperative, cooperative or not, remains to be seen. And so that's a, another issue that would have to be resolved here. Thank you. I have questions. Yeah. Staff, um, Cliff, I don't know if you have questions, but um, yeah, how establishment of assessment districts, uh, what guidelines do those go by? I mean, because there, I there's, it's, it's by state law. There's state law? section in the uh, Streets and Highways Code that yeah. defines. So we got numerous places in Brisbane. This is the, I, I think this is the first time we've. I don't think we've ever used this particular process. I, I, Tim had mentioned there was, there was one many, many years ago, but I'm not familiar with it. And I, we certainly have not used it since, um, since I can recall. I, not that I'm familiar with, N not for an assessment district. Yeah, I'm not aware of any that exist in the city. We've had assessments. But there are different types of assessments. So, for example, a landscape and lighting district that we right, have in Sierra right. Point, um, that's under a separate section of the state law, and that's simply to put in landscaping and lighting and the like, and it's usually part of an overall development as it was at Sierra Point. We have not, to my knowledge, ever formed an assessment district strictly for the point of building a, land, building a road and, and assessing the, the property owners who are using that road. So. Yeah, this this would be a first as far as I know for Brisbane. So we have a few of these, you know, I can think of two, three, three of them off the top of my head. There might be might be a few more that fall in this category that are private roads that have numerous houses on them. Mm -hmm. And in order for people to develop maybe the, that have a lot on there, I, I, there was an approved development. I mean, they can get an approved development or something, but but to widen the road to really do it, uh, you'd have to form this assessment district. But that, but that's all it says. And I'm not really clear is you know, I guess the nuts and bolts of of how that works and you know, the the, the mechanics of it. And it sounds like there's a lot of data that needs to be gathered. And having an engineering drawing to say, yeah, okay. I mean, because uh, I mean, there's like looking at Margaret itself. There's so many potential impacts, and it doesn't. Yeah, is well, it going to require uh, an environmental impact report? I oh mean, yeah, it, it, yeah. So I mean, <clears throat> should that be part of it then? I mean, it's part of the project, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess my question would be then. That, you know, I'd kind of really look for some guidelines. To, to go by well you know not the, just applying to this project but you know to the other areas that well the process is governed by state law and it's, it's fairly straightforward you uh -huh. come back with a drawing of the proposed boundaries you have to have plans and specifications for the proposed improvements you you should have been a you you must have determined the the cost of those improvements mm-hmm if they're going to be funded through a bond issue, then that's factored in as part of your cost. And then what's maybe the more difficult part is those costs then have to be allocated to the various properties that are part of the district. And Prop 218 requires that the allocation essentially be based <coughs> on the financial burden that the assessment district is imposing on and that are assumed by each of the properties mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the voting. Uh, so you, you, there are different ways of doing an allocation, uh, but that's one of the issues that needs to be decided. The state law simply says you have to allocate based upon the benefit. And, and as you know, the testimony you've already received, 
uh, shows there there are different views on what constitutes a benefit, but that's one of the issues that needs to be resolved. Sure. And the council can always say, well, we, we think this whole thing is going to be too expensive or is going to be too impactful or for other reasons. After you get the information, you can simply say we're not going to move forward with this and take it to a vote. Yeah. Well, I mean, even stepping back further, uh, you know, I'm, I think maybe it's something we should send to the planning commission on on dealing with assessment districts in general. That all these areas are, are like they're they're very similar, mm -hmm. specialized. You know, some of them are dirt roads. Uh, you know, uh, no paving. They're you know, well, to slide. the other thing, and, and, and there are some planning issues involved in this district because there are some properties up there that uh, are capable of development, and I think one or two are capable of, of being subdivided and having more than one home on it, and those are all planning issues. So to the extent even this project involves, you know, planning considerations, that's, that's really part of the analysis. So would you suggest sending it to the Planning co Commission first to look at those considerations? I mean, that that's what I would consider, you know, doing. I, I think the council can. They would not make decisions with regard to the mechanics of the assessment district. That's, that's strictly a council decision. But if you feel that there are some uh, planning issues that should be considered that would be taken into account by the council in deciding whether or not you know, the assessment district is appropriate for the area. Uh, you know, I, I don't think there's anything in, in the assessment district law that precludes you from, you know, getting an opinion by the commission either as to this particular district or districts in general. Yeah. It is already the policy of the city as incorporated in the general plan that assessment districts be used as the vehicle to obtain the street improvements or infrastructure improvements. The reason for that being the city doesn't have the resources on its own to just go up there and build a street with general plan money or general fund money. Well, I, I think it would. I think it would help, you know, going through that process of them looking at, you know, from a planning point of view, you know, particularly to this project, but also the other areas and kind of develop those ideas or. You know what they suggest. You know specifically to maybe to this project, but also the other areas. You know because this is the first time we've kind of really dealt with this. You know, and it's uh, almost like, well, here, you know, it, it, if uh, you're inclined to refer it to the planning commission, I think the assignment of the commission would be to revisit the policy that's in the pro the existing general plan and also carried forward in the proposed general plan. Uh, mostly in the circulation element, that assessment districts, you know, be, expo be explored as the means of providing infrastructure improvements. You might want to have some other guidelines in there that relate to the nature of the area, that relate to cost considerations, all of the concerns that have been raised by the neighbors here. But you know, I, th I think that's within the discretion of the council if you want to do that. But I, I think you, you need to, if you're sending it to the commission, then the assignment to them should be phrased in planning terms and, and maybe in, in the sense that, you know, we have these policies in the general plan. Do we want to elaborate on them? Do we want to change them? Uh, do we want to have some additional standards rather than just saying, here's an assessment district, you know, go for it? Uh, because I think that essentially that's the message we're giving now. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it's just, you know, I don't know, it almost seems like you're looking at something. I don't know if this is the place. I guess is this the place to start a development? You know, I mean, the, the, you know, I, I know the gentleman wants to build his homes or, or whatever, whatever he wants to do up there, exactly. Um, but is that the starting point of this? This is the place to start for an assessment district. Oh, okay. Um, but if you're talking about planning issues, then, you know, the, the commission could be get involved, but the command, the planning commission would not get involved in the development until there's an actual proposal to build something. Right. right now, the assessment district process is through, it's basically an engineering study of, of developing the boundaries, um, preparing the plans and specifications for the particular improvements, and then allocating them among the various properties. The council then adopts resolutions to 
uh, create the district and to impose those uh, assessments, which then you know go on on the uh, the tax rolls and the like. So th that's that's that in itself is a council function, not a planning commission function. Okay. I think what I'm saying is is if you think some input from the commission is appropriate, my suggestion, since the commission is essentially a a planning body, right, is maybe take a look at the planning aspects. Uh, of forming yeah, assessment yeah. districts, not only here but in other areas where we have similar problems, because yeah. there are planning implications. I mean, once the road is in, then you know that opens the the way to the development of those parcels. Right now, you cannot develop unless you have the road that meets city standards, right. and quite frankly, that has prevented the development up there, and and that has <laughs> basically allowed the city to become the major property owner because people have realize that unless the road is up there and the, they know the city's not going to build it for them, there's not enough cooperative action to form a district to, to get it built. The only option then is sell it to the city as open space, and we, we've acquired a lot of land that way. So, mm -hmm. well, actually, so. Uh, actually, looking at it, you know, I had Wendy do a map up and looking at it that the city owns the majority of it. I mm -hmm. mean, can, can we put that up overhead maybe just... Well, we do now. Just to look at it, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, I agree with you. I think you know, there may be something that we don't, we're not seeing yet, you know. We, we, I hate to go through all this engineering and the expenses and all that. I mean... Only look, to find out that planning has a, has a real issue with it. You know. What do you think, Cliff? I mean? uh, you know, I, I think um, I think Hal, from what I from what I can get from what Hal is saying, that that right now the council uh, needs to decide whether or not uh, we should allow um, uh, Mr. Ungolian to uh, have the study, the engineering studies, uh, go forward, and mm -hmm. that he would be obligated to pay for those and then to also have the consultant um, to do their work as well yeah. but if uh, if there was a project then of course then it would go to the planning commission but right now there there isn't a project yeah. um, there's just this investigating to see whether or not an assessment district could be formed and if is appropriate how we yeah uh, yeah and how we proceed with that yeah. Can we blow that up a little bit more? I don't want to digress from it because we're getting kind of late in the hour. But anyway, everything in green is city purchased open space. And the parcel in the upper left is city owned lots that were donated to the city that used to be the Panone property which are right next to the proposed, I guess, or potentially proposed development. Is, is that correct? Uh, is anybody, Randy? You're in the right place, yes, sir. Okay, and then there's one acre that the city doesn't own in that yellow outline, and then everything that's on the other side of that outline, I don't know if people can see, but it has like a red D on it. It shows that they're developed. You can go back the other way. Go back the other way. Okay. Yeah. Now I mean, just to get it, just to get get a lay of the land. That that really, I mean, there, we're we're talking that it's not going to go past any any potential development in the future if if this. You know, jumping ahead, if all this stuff was done, it wouldn't go past that whatever whatever that lot is, seventy nine there. Yeah. yeah. Let me let me just clarify also for the audience is not familiar with that area. It, it looks like there are lots up there, but there really are not. That is that has never been a legal subdivision. Those parcels were conveyed out individually at a time when there was no regulation for making conveyances like that. The columns you see, which are not colored are what we refer to as the paper streets. Those are kind of the remainders because the lot lines were drawn, not the, the parcel lines, I won't even call them lots, were drawn to those, to those streets, but they don't exist as streets. They are not streets, it's just more vacant land. 
and, and all of those areas are the areas that used to be owned by the Fern Trust and were acquired by this, this one company. Uh, we've had discussions with them about conveying those sections to the city and having the square footage uh, purchased by someone who's looking for a density transfer on other areas of uh, down down the mountain where we would allow density transfers to occur but but right now if you were the owner uh, of the one parcel at the top of the mountain there you really don't have a street heading to your property and in fact if you want to build <laughs> you would you would have to build a road all the way down and so you know for all practical purposes uh, the development of that lot is is highly problematic at best. So, uh -huh. but those are not legal lots, and and the title companies were in the habit of of calling it Brisbane Acres Lot Number Whatever, and we've always insisted that it just be identified by legal description and assessor's parcel number. Uh, so there has never been a, a legal subdivision up there, which is why the infrastructure is not there to serve it. But the fact is that the most of them are owned by the city of Brisbane for open space purposes. Yeah, all the green is owned by the city. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, I do have a question yeah, go for uh, staff. So um, so if, if the council approves to do the evaluation and we get the information that comes back to us and it shows that, that the amount of money that would be uh, required from all the property owners um, is excessive. And the council decides that is the case and decides not to have the assessment district. Is the, the Mr. Ungulian, does he have the option of, of uh, paying for the road to his properties himself. Sure. The assessment district is, is simply a funding mechanism. If somebody had unlimited financial resources to not only build the road but also acquire the right of way, uh, and the land needed to build a road to city standards, um, that person as the developer could build the road to his property and that's what we normally require developers to do and then dedicate it to the city as a public street. The reason all those properties were not developed is because no single property owner had sufficient financial resources to do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. And we've always said we're not we're not prohibiting development up there. We're simply saying you need to, you know, you need to be, pay for it yourself. And if you can't pay for it yourself, then, then do it through cooperative action uh, with other property owners through an assessment district. Or they don't even need an assessment district. They could just... A handful of property they could They could enter into a funding agreement among themselves mm -hmm. and, and contribute toward the cost of that and exclude everyone else. So if the property owners who really want to see a road up there are really interested in in paying for the cost themselves without the involvement of those property owners who don't want a road, you know, they could do it as long as they were able to acquire the, the land needed to build the road to the city standards. So the, the assessment district is simply the way to raise the money, but it doesn't prevent them from paying, paying for it themselves. Thank you. I'm, I'm really not ready to even vote on executing an agreement. You know, not one way or the other. Because we're new to just. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, no, we definitely should hear a public testimony. And and I don't want to hear it tonight, to be honest. Even no, though everybody's late. here, that that yeah. it's. I mean, sorry, but it's really kind of what is it, ten twenty-five right now? But I think we should set a special meeting for this to address alone. This is there's a lot to it, and uh, you know, I think that we need to. Uh, well, since people are here, it, what if we if we limited the amount of time for them to speak? And, and well, we're going to have to extend the meeting then. Cause, yeah. I mean, we got we still got a lot of stuff on the agenda, and th these items I believe need to be addressed on the agenda. That's true. How many how many slips we have? Uh, yeah, there? and then we have a closed session after that, and yeah. Okay. How, how many slips do we have uh, for this particular item? For this item? Yeah. We've got quite a few. 
Let me let me ask. How, how about if we ask the, the people if uh, in the audience if if uh, they're amenable to coming back to another meeting? What about that at a later date? What about this, Clark? Um, uh, you know, we have received uh, some information from uh, members of or. Um, uh, well, we got a lot of letters. Of here, yeah. Um, I know that one of the letters that, that we got was written by Sean Sweeney, and there was a lot of property owners that were um, assigned, assigned to yeah. that letter. So perhaps maybe um, if it's okay with those property owners, if they could have uh, Mr. Sweeney uh, speak, and then Mr. Angulian speak tonight too, and, and limit it to just those, those two and then continue. I think it's all or nothing. Uh, <laughs> I think it's all or nothing. I mean, I'm just trying to accommodate you just so you can get. Uh, um, there, there's a lot here. And uh, I, I'd like to extend it to a. a this, there's no time frame yeah. on this, of course, right? So, I mean, I'd like to extend it, like, you know, to maybe sometime in September, have a special meeting and uh, and then deal with it then. Yeah, because because um, our next meeting is August first, right. tentatively. We're thinking about having that meeting, or is that is that official? That's for sure. That's for sure. Okay, and and I will be on vacation. Right. So I'm saying. Right. So, I didn't know we were gonna have that other meeting. No, no, no. I'm so. I'm, I'm saying September. I'm yes. September, October. You know, kind of fit but in. And I'd like we, some we, feedback from staff. On well, that. first of all, you, you certainly have discretion to continue this to a later time when there's going to be more time for everyone to speak. Yeah. You also have speaker slips from everyone, which I assume contains addresses as well. If not, we can be sure that the people put their address on. I think we can send a mailed notice to everyone who has submitted a speaker slip of of the date when the, the next meeting on this will occur along with uh, a mailed notice to anyone else who asked the city for a special notice of that meeting. So to be sure that, that these folks are aware of when it's going to come back to you. Um. I'm not ready to vote it one way or the other on it. You know, I just, I just think we need to extend, uh, have another meeting specifically for this. No other stuff on the agenda, because it's just going to be us three, and uh, deal with it then. The the next uh, or the first off Monday in September would, would be September 12th. Or if you want to do it at uh, two weeks later, September 26th. Anybody on vacation in the audience then? Uh, I might be tough to accommodate everybody, but um, I, you know, if you're if you're uncomfortable with, um, you know, and the thing is, right? We, sh I mean, there's a lot of folks that want to speak tonight, yeah. right? And so, you know. If, if, let me finish. So if, if, um, you know, if we had everyone speak tonight, I mean, we would be here a very, very long time. And I, I, I hear you. So, um, and, you know, because this is such a very important issue, I mean, you want us to be fresh and to be good listeners and to, and to do this thing right. And so, um, and sometimes, you know, it, you know, it takes a while to absorb all that information and, and give you, you know, a good uh, response from us. I mean, you, you you would want us to be, you know, respectful of, of of the situation and not not rush it through. So, I I, I hear you, ma'am. <laughs> no, I'm I'm yes. not willing to do it. Okay. Um, I, I don't I don't know where you're at, Cy. I have a, I agree with you. Yeah. I think. I think there is. I'm sorry, but I'm I'm just not going to go forward with that. I'm I think that we should take a special meeting for this, the three of us, and deal with it then. And then we can give people and I have the due time that they'd like to have. Yeah. Yep.
apologize for that, really. I apologize. Yeah. About October. I'm fine any of those days. October 11th. Mm. That's fine. And um, do we need to televise this or probably? Yeah. Okay. That's right. And that's no cost to the city, correct? So, yeah. Okay. Then we should televise it. Okay. So do we need a motion to extend that? To continue it? To continue the meeting? Yeah. Okay. I can make a motion to continue to I'll give you a second. this hearing till October 11th. I'll give you a second. Then. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. You want to go to new business, or do you want to pass that on? Yeah, we gotta we gotta pass. We gotta crank it out. <sighs> okay, under new business, item A, review argument in favor of measure on November the eighth, two twenty eleven. Is your microphone on, sir? Is my mic on? No. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Okay. A review argument in favor of measure on the November 8, 2011 ballot establishing a new business license Buy it, please. on certain recycling businesses. Uh, Mr. Mayor, th this is the um, proposed argument um, in favor of the measure that will be on the November ballot. The one... Um, Change I would suggest to you under the third bullet point where it says a fee is not assessed against Brisbane garbage collector I would write a fee is not assessed against a current Brisbane yeah. garbage collector okay council yes I, I agree with I agree with that, that. Yeah. yeah move approval yeah. I'll second that we have a second all in favor all right, all right. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I have it. Item B is consider introduction of Ordinance 563 to comply with Voluntary Alternative Redevelopment Program. So this is the item that I had alluded to earlier. Voluntary is a very interesting word when we talk about this. The state passed a bill and governor signed it, which eliminated redevelopment agencies. They then said if the city volunteer, voluntarily provides money to underlying districts, including school districts, fire districts, and a, and a couple of other types of districts, then the redevelopment agency could exist again, could uh, continue. The amount of money that the state has uh, put into their budget as uh, revenue from this is $1.7 billion for the current year. Um, that doesn't mean that $1.7 billion actually exists in available redevelopment money. It's just a number that they chose. I think part of the reason they chose that is because that's what they chose two years ago as a number. They have said that for the one point for this current year, 2011-2012, if the city voluntarily agrees to this, um, then they, the city could use uh, redevelopment agency funds and the current allotment for the low mod housing fund. Uh, the the issue that we face in all of this 
is that our redevelopment agencies are, you know, are still, if you look at our RDA1, maybe it's about 60% built out. There's still some public improvements that I think the council has talked about doing, like a plaza where redevelopment agency funds could be available and could be used. There's also a, a portion of the Baylands that's in RDA1, uh, the south of the creek, where public improvements like parks and open space. Uh, so having redevelopment funds for that would be very useful. And in RDA2, as you know, it's still a brownfield. There's a number of public improvements that need to be done um, in RDA2. The challenge that we have is that the current amount that the, that the CRA thinks that we would owe based on the 2008-2009 um, state controller's report has us a little bit over $2 million. Uh, we don't have $2 million available in RDA1 nor in the current allotment of the housing fund, so we would need to use some of the general fund funds for that. However, from a uh, certain process, certain idea that the state controller's report does not accurately reflect the debt of the redevelopment agency, uh, there are some technical issues that we're trying to work out with the state controller's office. We have phone calls into the state controller's office, um, and unfortunately at the moment they're not returning those phone calls. I can't imagine why, since I'm sure there's about 400 other agencies <laughs> can't be too busy. calling the state controller's office over this. Uh, so if we decide not, to, if we do, so the reason we're before you tonight is to put an ordinance before you to voluntarily move forward. Uh, disbanding, I think, the agency at this time for us would put us in a worse con situation um, than continuing it. There are there will still be cleanup language. We had, there was a meeting with Assembly Member Hill last week, where uh, we will. He said that there is going to be cleanup language that will help clarify some of the issues. One of the issues as a city that we hope Mr. Hill will put forward is being able to use the low mod housing. Um, reserves available for a, this 1.7 uh, billion dollar payment that would help this that would help us tremendously with our general fund um, also to let you know the redevelopment agency currently provides about 500 to 600 thousand dollars a year to the general fund for general staff that the general fund provides back to the agency so if we were to lose the redevelopment agency on an ongoing basis, we would lose that ongoing funding source. Um, a lot of those positions are positions that we would not lose. Um, you know, there's a portion of our city engineer that's in there. There's a portion of the city council that's in there, a portion of the city managers in there, some of the accounting functions. So these are functions that we would not lose, so, but we would lose the revenue. We have not done anything with our redevelopment agency as have been reported in other papers. Uh, you know, one of the areas where I think some of the Southern California cities have taken some grief over that is that they provide for police and fire services. We have not done any of that with our redevelopment money. We have never given a direct payment to a developer with our redevelopment. It has always been for public, pro public projects. The biggest <laughs> one is the, is the marina. We've also paid for the community park with it. We have paid for the fire station with it. We have paid for the on and off ramps to Sierra Point with it. With the housing fund, we have developed the senior housing project on the corner of visitation. We have done Habitat for Humanity projects with it. We are in the process of buying the Lao project to do more Habitat for Humanity. One of the issues that we raised with the assembly person was that there's a requirement in the state to do low mod housing in, within cities, and this is the only financing source that cities have to provide that housing. So that would be something if we got rid of the redevelopment agency, if we did, if we did not make this pay, this voluntary payment, we would lose the ability to 
really meet our RENA numbers, which would cause us other financial issues in the future. So from all those, for all those reasons, as staff, we recommend that we, and, and I guess, you know, keep saying voluntary is kind of a hard word, uh, is, to me is the wrong word, that we pay the mugger. The ransom. The ransom. I'm basically, as an agency, we have a gun to our head, and we are being told that if you do not give us, willingly give us your wallet, um, we will kill you. I, I probably could turn to the police chief and ask if that would be considered legal in this state or anywhere. Uh, and they say, oh, well, you know, as I get mugged, he says, he gave me his wallet voluntarily. And I think that's the situation that we're in. So, th I mean, it's a very precarious situation for us. It's a precarious situation for redevelopment in general. Um, but I think uh, proving the ordinance, introducing the ordinance tonight, and approving it gives us the most options available. Um, as with any ordinance, if we decide later that this is not in our best interest going forward, we can always adopt a new ordinance. Um, also, there are, you know, I just read tonight that the CRA, the California Redevelopment Association, has filed lawsuits uh, over this issue to try and put an injunction on it. The, uh, I think it's Union City and San Jose are also joining with CRA on the lawsuits. So the legislation may be overturned. There's issues with Prop 22. There's some constitutional issues with redevelopment law that this these or, these this legislation seems to be in um, in conflict with. So there's a lot of issues that are still. Um, mulling around, but unfortunately there are some very hard dates in the legislation, the first of which is August 26. And that's what we're trying to do, is we're trying to beat the gun so that way we can continue our agency for that August 26 date, leave us as many options available moving forward, and you know, do what's best for this community. Uh, this community has talked often about you know, wanting to be a model when it comes to open space and having funding available to do that. And, you know, that's, I think, where most of our redevelopment resources would be, seems to be, that they'd be committed to in the future. And the low mod housing is an important aspect yeah. of, for our community. And if without redevelopment, we would lose our ability for any low mod housing. And we're not quite sure how the successor agencies would work because in the law, we would be one vote of seven. And so we may not have what's best for our community because an outside agency would tell us what would be best for our community. And I don't think we want to give up that local control either. No. Thank you. Before we go too much further, we need a motion to continue the meeting. It's a quarter to 11. So give me a motion, motion to, to continue 11. to 11 o'clock. To 11 o'clock? Second. Okay. And then I have two slips on I'll this. Question. I have a question. On the motion. All in favor? Right. No, I have a question. I'm sorry. It's a motion to extend to, to 11. To extend the meeting. Oh, yes. yes yeah. Okay. Well, Just a question. All right. We have two slips for this particular issue. How would you like to do this? You want to hear those first? Yeah. Okay. Are you finished, Stuart? Okay. Linda Salmon. Linda? As you probably know, uh, many of us in Brisbane have uh, come to realize that the redevelopment agency is, ha is and has been our enemy. And that is the agency that keeps um, pushing for um, more growth, more development, more houses. And it's all very complicated, um, uh, the financing of it back and forth. I'm really, really grateful that um, <clears throat> Governor Brown has pulled the plug on this. I think most people are, have finally gotten wise and we're sick and tired of paying through our taxes for the infrastructure so people can come in and build their buildings and make a profit on it. Uh, um, that's, that's, I think we've had enough of it. Personally, I would just as soon let the whole thing go down in flames. Um, and I think that if you want to put an ordinance on the ballot and ask people to vote on it, that might be another set of circumstances. But 
just to keep pushing and continuing this <clears throat> monumental disaster of redevelopment. Um, this is what the county of San Mateo had in mind for Brisbane when Brisbane decided to become a city. Um, San Mateo County had called Brisbane urban blight and sought to get rid of us through redevelopment. And of course now, thanks to some people, we're doing it to ourselves. So I personally think we should just kill it ourselves, totally. No more redevelopment. Thank you. Terry O'Connell, Terry. Terry O'Connell, Brisbane resident. I'll try to be brief on this. Um, there's been reports in the newspaper about Brisbane having some of the highest redevelopment debt in the state. Um, we're in the top 10, I have to say, um, from what I've read. I don't know enough about redevelopment, but it worries me that it's, it's robbing Peter to pay Paul as we go down the road. Um, it's putting in things that we want to see, but not paying for them right now. And so I understand that the state changing the rules um, puts us in a predicament because we've already borrowed this money. We've already got this indebtedness that Stuart says we have a hard date of August 26th, and we might need to do something about it immediately. So while I can see having to deal with it right now and making that hard decision to continue it or not continue it, I think that we should have a hearing about the ongoing plans for redevelopment. I don't think that borrowing money to change the brownfield is a good idea. So I think there's picking and choosing that needs to be done. And I hope that we can look at that further before we get too committed to redevelopment staying as a permanent fixture. Thank you. Thank you. You know what, Mr. Mayor? I, I would really like staff to address that, especially the newspaper arg article that just inaccurately described. So, I mean, I, I think the first thing let me respond to is that the debt would continue to be paid. So the money from redevelopment to pay off the bonds would still be used to pay off the existing bonds. So there would not be... What were the bonds used for? The, the bonds were used uh, for the marina, to pay for the marina and to pay for the on and off ramp for Sierra Point. Um, the majority and the vast majority um, was for the marina. Um, we have also used redevelopment debt a little bit to, for the fire station as well. And there was, um, there's also redevelopment debt for the senior housing project. Um, the article um, I think stated that we had given money to developers and the developers have never paid us back. $20 million. Right, and we've never done that. We've never given any money to the developers. Um, the re marina debt, the senior housing project, and the fire station are all being paid off as per the bonds require us to every year. Um, I think the one for the marinas about $2 million every year that we're paying coming out of redevelopment funds. But that was, you know, that was not for the developer. That was to provide a public um, good, a, a public place. Uh, and I think going forward, any additional bonds that would ever be sold would go through a public process. Whatever projects that the redevelopment agency would approve would go through a public process. Um, and, I, you know, having been in this community now for 10 years, um, having heard a lot of the history of this, for, for, of this city, I have every faith that, this, that the residents who live in this town would only, would only approve projects that, you know, they thought were the benefit of the town. And I think the community park is one of those examples where the community spoke out against what was being proposed. So, so Stuart, uh, just the marina itself, the bond is it, using the tax increment, the property tax increment, to pay the bond that built the marina, but the marina itself brings in about $1.1 $1 million. Right. The marina itself, I think, actually brings in just about $1.3 million. 
um, into the city and it costs us about 900000 every year to um, run it. So there's about a $400,000 um, revenue source that we use to pay for a portion of our parks and recreation programs. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Um, as we know, the lawsuit was filed today, and the League of Cities believes that what the state is doing is un unconstitutional. And let's say the League of Cities win the case, and we have voluntarily pulled out. What next? Well, if this law is not um, constitutional, then we would just rescind whatever ordinance we approved. It would be one way to do it, and I don't even know if the ordinance would be would be null and void yeah, because the, there's the nothing to react was, to. Was initially, they're asking for a stay, which means that the law would be prevented from going into effect until its ultimate legality was determined by the Supreme Court. If it was ultimately determined to be unconstitutional, we simply would not be required to make any payments uh, to the uh, to the state. So our ordinance should be written in such a way that this is based on the action that the state has taken. So if if it, if they found that it's illegal, I think there is language that effect that's already contained in there as a recital that um, just, just keep in mind that the, the, the action to eliminate the agency has, has already taken place so the action that you're taking is to reinstate it right if you look on page three of the ordinance where it says effective stay or determination of invalidity on in section three um, I think it, I think it deals with the issue that you have. Um, this has been an ordinance um, that we uh, the model ordinance was from the CRA, and it was reviewed by our redevelopment council. So I'm very comfortable that you know they've taken into account those kinds of contingencies. If I may, uh, oh, sure. the mayor. Um, so if we approve this tonight. Uh, there's that $2.2 million that, that the RDA would have to pay to the state. So uh, when is the state asking for that money? Well, the, 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 or, the state or the, ordinance? Yeah. the state is actually not asking the redevelopment agency to pay it. They're telling the city that the city is paying it. The city pays it. And the we city would, pays okay, it. We but money. we can get money from the redevelopment agency in order to make that payment. And that's an important yeah. distinction from the state legislature's perspective. Because redevelopment money cannot be used for the purposes that the state is requesting this money to be used for, which is why they've asked the city to pay for it. They've okay. tried to find their way around this law. However, Prop 1A says the city revenues are the city revenues. And that's why they've now made it voluntary. I mean, they're working very hard at this. I, okay. there, but there's a number of points that CRA would say are quite unconstitutional. The first payment would be due in January after the property taxes are received, and the next payment would be due in May after the second round of property taxes are received. Okay, and so is that enough time for a, a judge to determine whether or not there's going to be a stay or not? I, I think for the stay, I think there would be. The, the news from CRA today was that they're requesting the stay by August 15th. Okay, so they're moving fast with that. Then. Okay. So that would be a yes or no. <laughs> okay. And then it would be appealed if it was. To move this along, I'll move that we introduce Ordinance 563. Yeah, I'll second that. We have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Yes, yeah, oppose. You're opposing it? I'm opposing because I don't believe, I don't, I don't want to pay to play. Correction on that. Uh, Sorry. Um, four eyes and one nay. The state, I believe that they're wrong, and I don't want to play their game. Okay. You you uh, pass it. You have enough people to. Okay. Okay. Item C. Consider authorizing city manager enter an agreement with Cyphers Consulting regarding assistance to the city sustainability committee. 
this is a consultant that the sustainability committee thought would be very useful in helping them complete their work. There's a lot of information in the staff report. The time is getting very late. Um, the funding would be uh, reimbursed by, the cost would be reimbursed by the developer. Okay. Make a motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Staff report. City manager. Nothing. Nothing. Mayor Council Matters. Subcommittee report. Just a quick thing on airport uh, noise. Uh, grand jury made a uh, investigation and um, they made a report on their airport roundtable ineffectiveness to address noise issues. Um, I, I know most of you know that we've been after airport to reduce noise impact over Brisbane. Virgin Airlines agreed and we have seen a drastic change from uh, flight noise from Virgin over Brisbane. Over the weekend, the weather was very bad and we had had some issues. However, I believe that Virgin, which in my mind, they were major corporate in violating airspace in Brisbane. They have done a remarkable job. Right now we are working uh, with Airport Roundtable and hopefully that we would get United and Southwest to come to the table and do the necessary changes. Airport is collecting data, noise on single events versus the um, versus about four, three, four months ago they put uh, noise monitors that gathered all day noise events and averaged, uh, gave us an average. So we're waiting for that result to take place. But in the meantime, I'd like to congratulate Virgin for doing a such great job in helping us. Thank you. Anyone else? No. Okay. Item B is considered council meeting scheduled through the end of 2011. Do we need to vote? At October 11th in there for a special meeting for yeah. the... And, and also, we, we have, in the last few years, not had the second meeting in December. Yeah. Okay. okay so then we'll to add please. October the 17th 11. as a regular 11. meeting? October 11th. 11th. Oh, sorry. And, and then take it's out December 19th, or do we, we need to keep that in there, or take it out? Take it, take out. it out. And, take it and out. we'll take it out December 19th, right? Yeah, all right. Okay. How about the rest, okay? Yep. Do we need a motion? I made a motion in case if you needed it. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, oral communications number two. An opportunity for someone to address the council not on matters the not on the agenda. There isn't much left. But... Come on, Tom. Uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> I'd simply like to ask what the, uh, the dates off. You're taking some time off in the summer, uh, August, September, or something. What, what are those dates? You'll not be here? It'll be it's December 19th. Here. That's all? No, we have a meeting Meet. August 1st, and then we come back September oh, 19th. Yeah, that's a good idea. We're canceling the meeting August 15th and September 5th and December 19th. But we're meeting every Monday morning uh, on the finance committee, the budget committee meets, all the subcommittees that are yeah. scheduled to meet, they continue meeting. Right. There are still meetings going on. Yeah. I just didn't have the schedule until sure. when you're off. Good. Okay. Sure. And your closed session. Closed session.